Welcome to Uptown Rumble, heavy music in the Bronx. My name is Stephen Payne, director of the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is February 13th, 2024, and I'm here with Irate, legendary Bronx band. Um, looking forward to hearing more about both the members' individual history and the band's history. Um, so before we get into things, why don't each of you introduce yourselves? Um, UV, do you want to start and then we'll work our way down? Sure. Hey, how you doing? The name is Yuval Dekel. I am the drummer of Irate. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Pay attention, <laughs> Phil. Uh, so my name is Phil Vasquez, a.k.a. Phil Vibes, and I'm also originally from Bronx, New York. Uh, my name is Fernando Sierra, uh, a.k.a. Nando Redwam, and I play lead guitar. Great. Thank you all, and thank you for uh, being here. So... Why don't you all now each talk a little bit about your family history and background and how your family ended up in the Bronx. Um, and again, we'll start with you, UV, and work our way down. Sure. I might have messed that intro, uh, intro up. AKA uh, <laughs> uh, uh, UV Rays is what uh, the band world remembers me by. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, I'm originally from Israel. I was born in Israel, uh, in Haifa. And I got to New York at the tender age of one. So uh, that's why the Yuval Dekel name comes into play. Sure. Um, so, yeah, we originally moved to Queens. Okay. Uh, we had a little stint in Long Island for a bit. Um, my parents split up around the age of five, and my dad moved uh, to the Bronx where he had been working um, and also was dating uh, a woman who would then become my stepmother. So that's uh, when, you know, uh, the parents split up. I ended up living with my pops, um, and that's when you know the Bronx sort of era of my life uh, began. Um, what else about that? Yeah, I mean, where, where in much... the Bronx did um, you live at first? Riverdale. Okay. Yeah, I pretty much throughout Riverdale. Throughout, uh, just Riverdale. moved around in the neighborhood just because that's where our family business sure. uh, was and still is. Sure. So um, yeah, I went to. Public school, a little bit of Hebrew school, kind of like a mix of uh, all of those worlds uh, growing up uh, in the Bronx. So, And did you have any other family aside from, you know, your immediate family that lived in the New York City area? Um, not too much, to be honest with you. Yeah. I've got, I mean, I have a small family to begin with. Even, sure. even back in Israel, it was yeah. a pretty small family where uh, both sides of the family were... Uh, you know, Holocaust survivors, so a lot of family members decimated, missing, so not not too much anywhere, really. Sure. Which which parts of Europe were your side? Yeah, family? so mostly we're from Romania. Okay. And then one grandparent was from Poland. Oh, okay. So those, wow. are, those are pretty bad. Yep. Bad, bad places, places to be from. during that time. Absolutely. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so what are some of your earliest memories, you know, whether in Long Island, Queens, um, and how old were you when you moved to the Bronx? Yeah, so five years old, okay. Uh, oh, okay. Bronx. Five, yeah. um, you know, uh, you know, prior to that, not too many memories. Uh, just odd, you know, core, you know, still shots of things that are probably irrelevant. Um, but, you know, growing up in Riverdale, it was cool just because... Uh, uh, the family business, just that part, that element was always cool. Just, um, uh, I don't know, man, it was the 80s. So you had a lot of character, a lot of grime. Uh -huh. uh, I remember, you know, like dad would take us to the city and uh, uh, it was always a good time. But it was like you had to <laughs> watch yourself a little bit. Um, but... Uh, uh, it was yeah. It's a good I mean, overall. Love being around all the culture, all the food, all the different kinds of people, and then ultimately, you know, later on in my teenage years, uh, when I got into some music, uh, the scene was something that at the time, you know, you didn't realize it was such a big part of who you are. Yeah, uh, I almost take it for granted, but uh, uh, it was cool. It was cool to have such options. Sure. Because I think a lot of kids grow up in the suburbs or in rural areas, and they don't have these, you know, 
these things readily available to them. And so um, they're waiting for big acts to come by or stuff like that. So while we had that, we also had this, you know, local scene that was really fun and cool and you got to meet people and hang out. Um, that's how we all met. And so that element is, uh, was awesome about growing up in New York. Yeah. And as, as far as your family's restaurant goes, mm -hmm. were you there on a very regular basis when you were childhood, like every day kind of thing? Um, uh, at was, times. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a point when we lived a, a block away. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I recall running around there, you know, as a little kid, um, trying to help out, probably being in the way more than, <laughs> than helping out. Um, yeah, look, it's always been there. Yeah. It's always been there. So I don't, I don't know what it's like without it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. So, um, um, and we're talking about, you know, Liebman's Deli. Liebman's Deli, so, that's right. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what it's like to live without it, but it's always been there. It's always been part of our identity. Yeah. Um, and before we get into, you know, much more as far as your musical development and all that, we'll obviously, um, hear from Phil and Nando too, but, uh, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about like, say other restaurants or other fixtures in the neighborhood that you remember, um, things that you did for fun around the neighborhood too, just, you know, more of a kind of, uh, portrait of the neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, well, as far as right, I mean, when I was a young kid, eating food wasn't, uh, too, gl you know, not glamorous, but it wasn't too different than anyone else, right? Sure, so sure, sure. you had pizza, uh -huh. you had local uh, fast food joints that were always a treat. Um, we didn't keep like a kosher home, yeah. so it wasn't like I was super restricted to, sure. to stuff. But uh, it was always fun to, to go and, you know, go down the hill in Riverdale and go to like Burger King or McDonald's or uh -huh. something like that. But, um, uh, you know, typical New York stuff, Chinese food. American Chinese food. Um, oh, yeah. Didn't there used to be a place where that bank, Apple Bank or something? Golden was? Gate. Golden Gate, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've seen that's... pictures of it before, but... Yeah, they still sort of exist down the hill, but I'm not sure oh. what the lineage is. Oh, okay. Um, oh. Food-wise, I mean, that's really all there is. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time in Long Island as, as well. Okay. So, like, my mom lived in Long Island from the divorce. Yeah. So I was whisked away every weekend. I see, you know? I see, I see. And that's the part that was like, uh, you know, I missed a lot of, like, friends hanging out, part, you know, birthday parties, this, that. Um, but, you know, when I was in the area, in the Bronx, in New York, you know, up to some no good stuff, I'd hang out, you know, like, by the Metro North tra uh, rail lines, you know, uh -huh. and doing some really dangerous stuff. <laughs> um, just a lot of punky stuff. Sure. Uh, but I think, like, being whisked away to Long Island, to the suburbs, where I didn't really have friends um, throughout my youth, I think that built up a lot of, like, rebellious uh, anger. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, I didn't know at the time, but, yeah, that... That was uh, wasn't a good thing, and so the moment was. So she she ended up moving away to California when, around ninth grade. So the moment I tasted freedoms on the weekends um, and freedom of going to the city for school uh, at the time, I, I think it all like kind of blew up, uh -huh. and the the mis you know, the uh, bad behavior I think grew. Um, <laughs> But, but with that grew a lot of like hanging out in really sure. cool places, you know, all the music stuff. Um, you know, nothing that I did was senseless. It just yeah. was, it took up a lot of time and some of it was dumb, but there was always an element, like an artistic sort of uh, element to it where I was uh, surrounding myself around, uh, well, in my case, just a lot of music. Sure. So, sure. Um, at least that. Sure. Yeah. Well well, thank you, uh, Phil. Um, why don't you uh, talk a little bit about your family history and background, <clears throat> how your family ended up in the Bronx? Sure. So uh, my roots go all the way back. I was hatched in uh, Roosevelt Hospital in Manhattan, uh, and we lived in the Bronx the first couple of years of my life. Uh, my mother was a single mother at the time. Um, her and my dad split uh, before I was even born, like months before I was born. So. Yeah. 
I didn't get to meet him till later on, but uh, the my earliest memories of just living in uh, an Elliott place in 170th. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Because uh, my grandmother lived in that neighborhood and my aunt, so we she my mother wanted to stay close to them. Uh, and then we did like one year. I had to be three or four. Uh, we did one year in uh, Puerto Rico. Okay, yeah, sure. My grandmother went there for a little while, so we kind of followed her. And then I came back around five years old. Uh, but before I came to the Bronx, we did a stop in Smyrna, Delaware. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, and we were just, we were happy there. Uh, from what I remember, I did kindergarten there yeah. and all that. But one day, uh, I remember this very vividly. My mother was coming home from a grocery store or something, and we were, and I was with her. And my brother was already born. He's, he's two years uh, younger than I am. Yeah. And we were walking. Now we're, we're Puerto Rican descent, and we see an entire parade of Ku Klux Klan. Uh, okay. Yep. And so that's when my mother said, okay, we don't belong here. Uh-huh. Uh, so she called my grandma, and my grandma went all the way to Delaware to go get us. <laughs> yeah. And, and then we kind of came back, and I split from my mom because my mom had to get situated here. Sure. So she stayed with my uncle in uh, the projects in Tremont. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, and I stayed with my aunt in Elliott Place nice. for a year or two. And then my mother got situated um, in Morris Avenue and Kingsbridge Road. And uh, I pretty much lived there most of my life into my young adult life. I see. Uh, I see. And that was, uh, and it still is, a, a <laughs> we call it Mordor <laughs> uh, because that's what it is. It's hell on earth. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't so bad for me because I had a lot of neighborhood guys sure. that, you know, were cool with me and... So it wasn't so bad, but if you were an outsider and, and you went in there starting any kind of mess, you were going to have a problem on your hands because the neighborhood is crazy and it still is. Um, and my mother is still in that neighborhood to this day. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Do you have family on Elliott Place still? No, they're all gone now. Yeah. Uh, my two cousins that were there are now in New Jersey, and my aunt lives uh, towards the Bronx. Too. I see. I see. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I don't know if, um, if you uh, – if you've heard this story from the Fahrenheit 451 guys, but hopefully you never. Yes, that's where they grew yeah. up too, like Armando and exactly. Frankie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hopefully you never tried to ride a bike on Elliot Place because Armando and Frankie would have stole it from you. Yes, <laughs> yes. Now Elliot was so Elliot. We used to call Isengard because it was the same thing. It was like violent is all hell and crazy and same thing. So Mordor and Isengard, and that's I was funny. like. That's where I spent all my youth, like just going from one that neighborhood to my neighborhood and hanging out there with friends. Then I uh, met this guy here, and we started hanging out like in at the end of junior high, uh, beginning of high school. Yeah. And uh, once I started hanging out with the metal crew, that was that became my my people. You know. How how did you meet him? We'll get more into you know public school experience and you know yeah. junior high high yeah. school in a little bit, but let's hear how you. So how you Anando and I met actually through a mutual friend uh, named Rich, and uh, I don't know how you met Rich, but he he was uh, the instrument that brought us together, uh, and the three of us uh, started playing music together, just kind of jamming, yeah. learning instruments and stuff, and just you know writing a little bullshit here and there yeah sure um but that's how we we came it was it was in school it was okay. in school in school so yeah okay great nando what about you your well, family history and background well uh my parents they lived in queens when they first met they yeah. actually lived across the street from each other in like the richmond hill area of oh queens. okay okay um i came along in 76 and from what my mom tells me, we actually lived in an apartment on uh, Rochambeau. Oh, on Rochambeau. Oh, so like very close to here. All right, but like I don't remember that. That yeah. was you know too young. And um, in '79, my brother came along, and then I remember we actually lived in Brooklyn. Um, I'm not exactly sure what neighborhood, but uh, I know it was on McKinley Avenue, wherever okay. the hell that's at. Yeah. And um, shortly after that, um, I lived with my aunt for a bit. Um, this is around the time when she was living like around uh, 102nd Street in Manhattan, between 2nd and 3rd, like the, the projects in that area. Yeah, sure. Um, and then shortly after that, 
Uh, my mom scooped me up, and we all moved to um, 196th Street on the Grand Concourse. Ah, and that's nice. pretty much where I spent, you know, about like 20 years of my life. Yeah. And, and what was that neighborhood like for you growing up? Um, it was a nice neighborhood at first, uh, in the beginning, with a lot of, uh, you know, old Jewish people. Um, then, you know, all the blacks and Puerto Ricans started coming in, and, you know, we all messed it up. <laughs> so the Jews left. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, I spent a lot of my time like, like hanging outside with the, you know, the other kids from, from the building, the neighborhood yeah. and, you know, playing games and, and stuff like that. And what was your, um, family's apartment like? Cause I know some of those grand concourse buildings, I mean, you know, right. the apartments were split into like many, many ones, but um, yeah, it's like a, like a pre-war building. I think yeah. I, the, the, the building that we lived in 2720, um, I heard back in the days it was like a hotel or something like that. I, yeah. It had, it has that kind of grand look, Yeah, that mm -hmm. old school, like hotel look. Like if, if you you know enter it and um um uh, you know pretty big big ass courtyard in the front big courtyard in the back and you know even though after a while they kind of closed it down because um the side facing uh Valentine Avenue was a lot of like you know drug dealers Drugs, and stuff yeah. like that so they didn't sure. want any of that stuff in the courtyard so they closed it down um <clears throat> but you know <clears throat> the apartments were you know nice and sizable yeah um. Had a lot of fun there. Yeah. And Nando was two and a half blocks away from me. Very uh, close. Yes, yeah, yes, very yes. close. That's right. Yeah. That's so. right. Um, so so why don't each of you say a little bit about um, music you heard in your family? We'll get into your own musical development in a little bit. But music you heard in your family or on the streets, um, just music you were exposed to when you were a child. I'm going to start with you. So at home, not too much music. I mean, there was some. Yeah, but the music was um, cringy, if you will. <laughs> oh yeah, like what? I mean, you know, my dad would put on like Neil Diamond or uh, <laughs> like some pop stuff <laughs> at yeah, the sure, time. Sure. You know, he's Israeli immigrant <laughs> in the '80s. You know, I I don't think they grew up with tasteful music in terms of American pop yeah, music. Sure, sure. You know, they had their own cultural music from Israel, which uh, I probably appreciate more now than yeah. ever. Um, but uh, not too much cool stuff. Yeah. I wish I could say, oh, yeah, you know, Dad, I was exposed to all this jazz music. When I was, <laughs> like, I don't have that story. Everything that I've uh, accumulated was from me kind of like pushing the envelope. Sure. And I got a lot of shit for that. Um, you know, Everything, all the typical, stereotypical, turn it down, you're making a noise, it sounds like shit, uh -huh. you're wasting your time, everything. I mean, not just, not just, you know, that happened when the band was around. Sure. Because the band, you know, uh, began its life at, at my house. And we can get into uh -huh. that. Oh, no. We can get yeah, into that sure later. But, <laughs> but, you know, in terms of, like, my upbringing... You know, it's not that it's not to say that there wasn't music around. There was um my mom, I believe, uh liked playing like clarinet when she was younger. So, um but I wasn't really encouraged to do it, you know. Sure. Typical Jewish like study, go to school, like uh focus on that. Yeah. Uh, and I did the opposite. Yeah. I like literally <laughs> did the opposite. Um, I probably should have listened a little more and done some of that a little more, but you know, it was what, uh, it was what kind of, you know, get that fire going inside. Right. So, so yeah. So I mean, when I discovered, um, I guess I was uh, into some pop music early on and then later, I guess my brother, yeah, it was my older brother. He was listening to, uh, a lot of hair metal. Oh, okay, okay. Van sure. Halen, Dokken, I remember uh -huh. all this like uh, guitar oriented hair metal, and then he 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 put on like some Metallica. Yeah. And I think that that sparked an interest. Um, I mean, all of it did. And then I guess at the time MTV was pretty pretty much you know very influential, right? Yeah, you had yeah. all the videos. <clears throat> excuse me, and. Um, I think I dragged my mother in Long Island. I dragged my mother to the local uh, Tower Records or something like that. And I might still have it, but I I bought uh, a cassette tape of 
Uh, it was uh, Master. I was it Master of Puppets or was the Five Ninety Eight Garage Days? One of those. Oh. Those two records are like. I mean, obviously one of them's a cover. Yeah. Uh, but those. Uh, yes, yeah, so I bought the tape, and I mean, it was that was the beginning. <laughs> Uh, I liked other stuff, but that really is what kind of elevated the interest. There, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, so that I kind of lived with a lot of like the bigger name thrash bands, right? For sure. a bunch of years. And then when I went to high school in the city, I went to Dwight, uh, for two years. I went okay. to Dwight on the Upper East Side. Yeah. And I, there was this dude walking around and he was wearing like these, these band shirts and I'm like I don't even know what that is and it was it was Chris Damore, um, otherwise known as the the Night Stalker. That's a whole other. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I that is I, I went to a record store and I found a record of like from one of his shirts that he was wearing and it was uh, Deicide. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, and so <laughs> after that I discovered death metal and went and jumped you know head wow. on into that world. Uh, just, you know, the whole gamut and, you know, going to shows, being around a lot of hardcore stuff. Um, yeah, that's just, just took off from there. Um, but it was always a love for personally for me of like progressive music too, sure. not necessarily metal, but sure. like, you know, jazzy progressive stuff. Yeah. And I didn't, I always had it kind of like in the back of my head and I was like, oh, no, one day I'm going to appreciate this more but i did like it yeah uh, it's kind of like with jazz too it's like i was always like i'm not ready for that i'm not ready for that it's really cool but i'm yeah. not ready for it and i'm not saying that i am now ready but i feel like it's get i'm getting closer to that age where uh i could appreciate and understand it more but that's pretty much my musical journey do you remember when you first turned on the, the day aside uh <laughs> tape what how you reacted to it well yeah i mean it was really f extreme yeah. the uh the speed you know the blast blast beats i was like what is he doing you know yeah, yeah. um i when i picked up uh their earlier stuff so they weren't called deicide it was called uh amen oh, okay. so yeah, okay. it wasn't like a great recording <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> demo. but i yeah i think it was a demo and then I w it wasn't too long after that where I picked up uh, Legion, oh, record see, Legion, see, see. and that just blew me away. I mean, I was just like completely uh, amazed at the guitar riffs. I mean, they were hard to, to sort of decipher because the yeah. you know the, let's be honest, the quality of the uh, playing, I mean the the recording isn't that great. But then also the drumming element to it um, was really new yeah. to me because I thought I was listening to Sepultura, Pantera, uh -huh. and all this stuff, and I thought that was the epitome of you know where you can take this. Yeah. And at the time, they were to me the epitome. But then you know when you listen to like a band, let's say like Obituary, you get the other side of the spectrum, right? Yeah. It's still the same genre of music, but a much different style. <clears throat> you know slower thicker doomier um so there was this cool um discovery of uh, this dynamic within the genre and to me it it was like it was so artistic and uh uh just uh, the nuances of it were were impressive to me uh but on the surface to like other people family straight you know just general public I mean, the, the stereotypes, ah, oh, you're a devil worshiper, oh, you know, it's noise and all that. That just drove me further into it because uh -huh. I'm like, you just don't understand. Like, uh, you never will. But, you know, so that that was cool. That was a cool element to it. I feel like nowadays so much is accepted. Oh, yeah, yeah way more than what I don't you think call. there's <laughs> there's no, like, there's no, I mean, maybe there's music that's out there. I mean, you guys like a lot of the tech death, te uh, tech death stuff that, I, you know, I, yeah, it's more and more extreme. And to me, it's like, I'm not really that into it anymore, but maybe that's an age thing. But uh, back then, it was badass. And one thing that's missing now is, like, grit. Yeah, Like, sure. there's no grit. Sure. Like, you know, when Guns N' Roses came out or these guys, like, you know, <laughs> the drugs, the abuse, the everyone now has to behave perfectly and has to like uh, not be an asshole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and, and that's fine. That's cool. It's probably better than not being an asshole. But there's something, you know, that was uh, attractive about the grit and grime of yep. fucking heavy metal and rock and all this stuff. That's right. You know? So grabbed us. Part, yeah, I mean, part of the very DNA of rock and roll music right. is, yeah. I mean, blues even, the sure. grittiness, all the rumors about you mm-hmm. know, Robert Johnson selling his soul mm-hmm. to the devil and so Certainly. All that. Um, yeah, I mean, look, you get these guys now, like gent guys and all this stuff, and they're great musicians. Yeah. And, I mean, they don't do drugs. Yeah. They're sober. They're vegan. They're just that. Fine. That's yeah. cool. And it's just that uh, they're also like, they're doing uh, they're doing lessons on tour. So they have a, a show on Monday, and then, oh, I'm available for lessons in this town on Tuesday. And it's like, you can't teach badassery. <laughs> you just, but that's like... But they do, and it's like, I don't know, the fucking grit ain't there. Um, but that's cool. I mean, I'm not hating on it. It's just different. It is. When it we is. grew up, I mean, it, you have to have been, like, badass on top of being a good player yeah. and cool, and, you know, uh, the shows were, were brutal and all that, and I think everything kind of, uh, even the way we behaved with each other, yeah. I mean, we, we were always really close, and we respect each other, but we're also, like, Fucking tough with one another. Yeah. And That's annoying. a tough love. Mostly annoying. <laughs> <laughs> so, so do you remember the first show that you went to? Yeah, I do, actually. Uh, the very first um, show was at the Marquee. Okay. Um, which still exists. It's just not called that. Uh, I went to a biohazard show. Oh. And I'm talking... Okay. 91, I am... Right? Yeah, I'm like... 91, I was, Wait, was thir- this, uh, 13. Urban discipline, probably. 12 or 13 years old. No. No? It was Biohazard first. first. first yeah. Nice. Yeah. So it must have been earlier than that. Oh, yeah. I was pretty young. I was in grade school. That was like 89 or something like that. My friend Steve Varconi's mom knew, well, I think her boyfriend at the time was somehow affiliated with Biohazard. So oh, okay. we went to the show, and uh, man, it was fucking... Brutal. Who else was there with Biohazard? That's a, uh, excuse me. Um, you don't that story, I right? don't. Yeah. I really don't. I'd like to name some bands, but I'd probably be wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, what was that <clears> show <throat> like? And did you, did you have the urge to go to get into the pit at that show? Oh, absolutely not. Because like, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm talking. I'm 12 years old. Yeah, of course. These guys were destroyed. massive <laughs> yeah. DMS crew yeah. there and I mean I had no idea what I was stepping myself I knew the material <laughs> yeah, it's sure, not sure, like sure. I was going there blindly I knew sure. this stuff but I had no idea about the whole culture and that goes along with it yeah um yeah it was yeah I, I were very overwhelmed but I liked it yeah I liked it yeah so um uh yeah, I definitely went back to it <laughs> and uh, so you, so you are already into hardcore, obviously you're into thrash and all before you got into death metal. Is that how it works as far as? Yeah. The progression was like, you know, Metallica, Megadeth. Yeah. Um, and you know, uh, I guess a, a little after I discovered Metallica, the black album had come out a couple of years later. Yeah. So it then grew and then, you know, MTV started accepting, you know, a lot of, uh, other acts and so it was pretty accessible yeah sure uh, right i mean you got uh i already named them so but they're a slayer and yeah, they're uh, slayer. Uh, <laughs> and Sarah, um but just the, the whole the whole anthrax uh, yeah everything yeah. um and you already mentioned you know kids at your high school that got you you know especially into into death metal but were there were there kids at your junior high who were into any of the same music as you were? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So growing up, it was me and, and uh, my friend Steve Arconi again. Okay, yeah, um, sure. We There was like a couple of us, like a little little crew. Uh, it was a Jewish school. Um, which, which junior high was can, it? Uh, was it junior high? Like, I guess it's like... Uh, or intermediate school, whatever. Yeah, middle, middle school. Like, yeah, middle a school. Kinneret Day School in Riverdale. Uh, yeah, I went there. Okay, yeah, yeah. I went to PS24 for a bunch of years. And then I, um, I mean, I kind of somehow went into like this Jewish school, which was, which was cool because it wasn't like super religious. It's a bit of a reform 
uh, school. And I, I appreciate that we that I went through that. Um, you know, I can speak Hebrew as a result of that, I would wow. say. And so that's pretty cool. And know another cool. language. Yeah, we had and, uh, later on, like, you know, seventh grade or so, a couple of us, you know, gained an interest in um, – in in the music so we would headbang at lunch and stuff like that but it was pretty innocent then and, yeah, sure. uh, uh yeah when i came in out into high school uh yeah i mean i mean i guess i met uh, a couple of really close friends that i still have now ari who was into like grunge a lot okay yeah, at sure. the time pearl jam and um faith no more yeah and uh, all sorts of stuff <laughs> so <laughs> That broadened my horizons a bit, but then, but I was really more into into like going into that like darker, extreme stuff. Yeah, and that's uh, that's what really interests me a lot. Um, yeah, that's the story. All right, Phil, let's let's hear from you uh, first, starting with your family's musical taste, and then getting into your own. Yeah, so growing up, my mother was uh, into Latin music, sure. salsa, merengue, uh -huh. all that. I uh, used to play heavy. She loved the Motown stuff. Yep. You know, so everything from, you know, Hector Lavoe to Marvin Gaye, everything in between, a little bit of R&B in, in between that. Yeah. And that was just kind of her musical taste. So sure. I got a lot of that. And then, you know, as a child, I would I was really into like 80s pop. Yeah. You know, everything from AHA to Police to, you know, whatever was big back then, you know, Bengals, uh -huh. you name it, I was into it, right? Michael Jackson, the whole gamut. Sure. But I was heavily into that. And then uh, I, I say about eight or nine or maybe even ten, I started to get into hip hop. Yeah. You know, the whole way Public Enemy, KRS-One, uh -huh. um, you know, everything in between. Rock him, Like so many. Big Daddy Kane, you know, Run DMC, all of that. Yeah. You know, uh, and that really, that was neighborhood music. So yep. you hear it everywhere. You know, there was also freestyle music in my of neighborhood course, for all the Puerto yeah. Ricans, uh -huh. right? So you had a plethora of sounds in my building, yep. in my home, on the street, you know, and I just took a little bit of everything, uh -huh. you know. And then one day, um, I was in my room, I'll never forget this, just changing stations, trying to find something cool to listen to, and Paradise City was on, GNR. And I said to myself, what the fuck is this? <laughs> I've never heard anything like yeah. this. Yeah. You know, hearing Slash wail away for the first time and Axel's amazing voice, you yeah. know. Um, and I instantly was like, I need to learn who these guys are. I need to go get this album and all that. Uh, and it took a while because, you know, I waited hours for them to repeat the song. <laughs> and then I got the name of the bands. And like a few days later, I remember um, going with my mom to a record store. Yeah. Um, on Fordham Road. Oh, the one on Fordham Road. Yeah, there were there were a couple back then that you can Beach get. Street. Beach Street was one. Okay. And then there was one, um, I forget the name of it, but it was on Valentine and Fordham. Okay. okay. Right there when you bend around to Fordham, there I was see. a little shop there and they had, you know, heavily hip hop and all that, but they had this one section where it was all metal. Wow. And, you know, I saw all these amazing album covers from like Iron Maiden and GNR and all this and I just grabbed a little bit uh, of everything that I can get. Um, and I started to broaden my horizons in school because I met other metalheads like Nando and Rich. And we started to like share bands with each other. But it wasn't until I discovered Metallica that I said to myself, uh, this is what the fuck I want to do. Uh, which, which album? Or so it was Injustice for All. all. Injustice for all. Um, you know, opening track is Blackened. Yeah. And that is one of the most amazing. That's probably my favorite song ever yeah. in metal. Yeah. Um, and that grabbed me like yeah. to, to hear, and James's voice at that point was like, you know, it was like, uh, Luke Skywalker, fully Jedi, <laughs> black, black outfit. You know, I always say that master, became a punk ass. <laughs> <laughs> that hurt my heart just now, but that's okay. <laughs> um, to an eye. Right. But it was that it was, he was Luke Skywalker in the black yeah. for that album. And his voice is just supreme. And I'm like, I, I want to be a vocalist. That's what I want to do. Wow. But then, uh, so after the metal comes the death metal, the hardcore. You know, with death metal, was uh, we used to hang out with this guy, Frank Lutchman. Uh, 
okay. in Clinton High School. I went to three high schools, by the way. Okay, I yeah, wasn't yeah. the best student. Yeah, let's. Uh, I wanted to hang out with all my friends, and they were all in different schools. So Which high schools? What are? They? Uh, so the first one was Kennedy. Okay. Uh, okay. Here, and, the, and then the second one was Stevenson. That's okay. towards Castle Hill. Yep. And then the third was with Nando and Clinton. Uh, and that's where I got my shit together and graduated. Uh, over threat of my mom putting me in military school uh, for cutting all the fucking time and hanging out with these guys. But Frank was instrumental in um, death, in like really extreme death metal yeah. and hardcore. I see. So, so what are some of the things he introduced? So he introduced me to the, the biggest thing he introduced him and I to was Brujeria. Oh, when we okay. heard that there was a Mexican uh, death metal fucking, we were like bugging out about that shit. Yeah, yeah. But and he was also the same guy that told us about all the Bronx bands. Yes, he, he used to go to. All yes, the Bronx, he used to go shows. to all the local Bronx shows, and and he um, told us all about these shows. So when we started going to local, it was because of him. Oh. And the first local show I went to was to see District Nine, which at the time was Close Call. Close call. Sure, sure. Um, and, uh, without a cause before uh -huh. they were Fahrenheit. Right. Yep. And they played at some church in Tremont Avenue. Oh, the church. I've heard, I've heard about yes. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Barry grew up across Yes. The I went to Barry. I went with Barry to that show. Uh, okay. Barry, Frank. And that's when I met Martin for the first time. Uh, what was it? What was that show called? Like Metal Fest? Or yes. Metal, metal Badness or some shit. Metal Man. Some, yeah, yeah, some, yeah, some crazy like shit that. like that. But they had a few shows, and it was the first time I was exposed to not only hardcore on a local level, yeah, sure. but um, the extreme dancing. Uh, and I got my my palate wet right away. I threw myself in there, and I thought it was the fucking greatest thing. <laughs> you know, got hit a few times. You, you get those bumps, and you get that rude awakening, but there was an adrenaline rush to it, too, at the same time. Sure, sure. Like, I'm going to fucking do this all the time. When, yeah. when is the next show? When can I beat somebody up or <laughs> have them hit me? Like, it was, it was crazy. Um, and, and that just kind of went on from there. Like, I started going to more hardcore, discovering more bands, Madball, Biohazard, all uh -huh. that. Um, and, the, and the local, you know, Fahrenheit, District 9, you know, um, who else? Durham by Hatred, sure. Go to Menses, sure. all of that. And even though they were all different from each other, we all got along and we all used to support each other at shows. Yeah. So, and that just kind of went on from there, man. Like, the more extreme, the better. Uh -huh. I'm always going to be a death metal guy more than anything else and, and thrasher. But I do like hardcore and I do like, you know, gent and all, all the different heavy stuff. Tech. We're mostly into tech death nowadays. Sure, sure. Uh, Nando and I are in a new band together called Knights of the Black, and that's what we're doing. Very techie. Uh, stuff and my son Jason's also in that band. I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about what an amazing guitarist your son is. <laughs> hey, well, it's because of this guy right here, his mentor, um, his Yoda. Yeah, uh, so, <laughs> a lot of Star Wars references. Hey, that's uh, good. references. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that it, it really just grew from there, and then we started irate, and irate played with everybody yeah you know all kinds it didn't matter what you were if we can get on a bill and expose ourselves to people that's what we did yeah um we you know did our first demo and used to go to every show and just give it for free you know to, to kind of generate any buzz that we can get sure and a, a little point later it started to grow yeah and we'll, we'll get more into the formation <laughs> of irate yep. in a little bit um and before we move on to nando uh do you remember was that was that show at the church? Was that your very first show in general, or had you been? To no, I had that? been uh, previous to that. My very first show ever was Slayer, Anthrax, and Megadeth at Madison Square Garden oh, uh, for yeah, the Clash of Titans. The Billy, the Billy Club guys <laughs> talked about that. Yeah, it's all downhill from there. Do you remember? Uh, I remember every second of it. specific about that show? Yes, I remember <laughs> that for Slayer, fans were throwing M80s everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and they stopped the show for for like 10 minutes because it was... And then, you know, Madison Square Garden was stupid enough to ham, um, nail in the seats on the floor. That went to shit as soon as Megadeth went on. Uh -huh. The chairs went flying and all that. It was Bethlehem mayhem. Um, and they stopped the show during Slayer. Slayer had to try to calm people down. <laughs> Uh, and that's, I was like, what the fuck am I getting myself into? Is this what this is all the time? Like, I got to worry about M80s blowing me up and shit. <laughs> so it was really extreme experience, but it was awesome. Yeah. And it just made me love it even more. Yeah. 
The next two shows I went to were GNR at Madison Square Garden okay. with Soundgarden. Okay, sure. Um, and then Danzig with him and his dad. Oh, that uh, was my first show. Where was that? That was Nando's first show. That was at the Ritz. The Ritz. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. On 54th Street, because there were the Ritz was originally the uh, Palladium in, in the city, and then it moved over to to Midtown over there, um, 54th Street, yeah. and then it went back, uh, and now it's um, what is it now? I forget what it is now, but yeah, um, uh huh, 54. But yeah, so those were my first three shows oh, okay. before okay. going to local stuff. Sure. You know, sure. and discovering the local scene. Um, at the Clash of the Titans, one of the funny things that Billy Pope got mentioned, at least a couple that I remember, I guess there was this big, big, uh, you know, metalhead, long hair, shirtless, who was just throwing chairs. Like, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure a lot of people were throwing chairs, but this guy in particular was oh, just yeah. made it his mission. Mashers. <laughs> it was like ECW. Like, you know, it was, it was ridiculous. <laughs> is, that, is that considered crowd killing nowadays? <laughs> Yes, those lo- the origins of crowd kill uh, were steel chairs. <laughs> it wasn't fist. Oh. All right, great. Uh, now, what about you? Um, you want to talk about your uh, music and your family and your development? Oh boy, we got three hours here. Yeah. <laughs> Four <laughs> hours. Uh. A lot of it's similar to Phil, like yeah. as far as like the stuff that my family listened to, <clears> like sure. a lot of the contemporary music of the time, a lot of uh, you know the R and B and the old school, you know. You know, whatever doo wops from the sixties, and sure. you know the Marvin Gaye's, mm-hmm. Michael Jackson's, and you know the Aha's, exactly like you said. But um, in addition to that, my dad also was a guitarist, yeah. And uh, so uh, I grew up watching him play the guitar, and he was, you know, into a lot of, a lot of rock, blues, yeah. um, jazz, Latin rock, and all sure. sorts of stuff. Uh, like I remember, like whenever we like take trips to like my grandma's in the car, and we'd be in the back. And he'd just be blasting, like, the rock music. Like, at that time, like, 92K, uh, 92.3 used to play a lot of, like, classic rock. And he used to just, like, on 10. And my mom used to be like, oh, you got to make the kids go deaf. Like, turn it down. <laughs> uh, I could hear her saying that. And then, um, um, let's see. Um, then uh, in fifth grade, um, I was recruited into my, uh, my school's band. Okay. And I learned how to play the trombone. Oh, cool. Um, and I did that you know, grades five and six. And then um, in between six and seven in the summer, I think like 87, um, hanging outside with a bunch of the kids. And, you know, uh, somebody had a radio um, playing Z100. And on came um, Sweet Child of Mine. Uh And immediately, like, as soon as I heard, you know, that that first guitar lick, I was just transfixed by how awesome it sounded. And I think it was at that time that I, like, um, because before, like, my dad, you know, he used to let me, like, play around with the guitar, but it, was, it wasn't anything that I, I thought that I'd take seriously, because yeah, sure. it was kind of hard. But when I heard that song, I was like, this is what I want to do. So then I started badgering my parents, like, you know, I want to play, and like, you know, I used to ask my dad, can I, you know, can I play, mess around on your guitar? But, like... You know, he has like this really old custom Les Paul from like 1957 yeah. that like, you know, he didn't want me like, you know, wrecking. Sure, so sure. like I would have to play under his supervision, but sometimes when he was at work, I'd you know, take it out of the case and start practicing or whatever. Uh, and then like that Christmas, they got me my first guitar, which was like some bullshit, no name guitar. And um, I learned a lot of stuff on that. And then I remember it was when I got to seventh grade, um, I met Rich, or Rich Ortiz, our, our, our mutual friend. He was another fellow metalhead yeah. that I think I just saw walking in the hallways, and like we just, you know, started talking and kicking it. And then he told me about like he had this other friend that he hangs out with, and then that's when he introduced me to Phil. And then that's when like you know the three amigo kind of like uh, friendship started, and I started hanging out with these guys a lot. Um, and it was around that time that I started listening to like. Slayer, Megadeth, Iron Maiden. I was introduced to the more heavier stuff, you know, the stuff that was a bit heavier than Guns N' Roses. Sure. And um, after that, um, what was it? High school that we started our first, you know, project or band. Yep. Um, the three of us. The three of us, yeah. Yeah, we used to, like, just jam and, like... Wait, what was the name of that band? 
So we called it Fatality, right? Because we were all video game marks <laughs> and playing fucking Street Fighter and Mortal Fatality. Kombat all the time. Yeah, of course. So that's what we called it. Okay. Right. right. And and what, what what was the sound that you all were going for at that? Time? Try to do thrash or our interpretation yeah. Yeah. of oh, yeah. of sure. that. Sure. You know, being sure. novices at the sign. Right. Yeah. Right. Practicing in uh, yeah. your apartment, which is yeah, yeah. No Rich. drums, just us on like you know guitar and bass. And, yeah. So you guitar, Rich was bass. And no, actually. No, no. Rich was a guitarist. He was the bass player. I was a bass player oh, first. Oh, yeah. I yeah. see. I see. I see. I see. Yeah. Uh, Short-lived, but yes, I, I, I did try the bass for a little bit. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, and you, I'm going to come back around and ask you this in a second, too. But but Nando and Phil, uh, since you're already talking about this, uh, where did you get your instruments, at least the first instruments? Did you go to the Bronx? I mean, your parents, I guess, got you guitar. Well, yeah, the, they got me my first and second guitar. The second guitar was, a, you know, a, a bit of an upgrade. It was a, an Ibanez okay, X360. Okay. Um, and to me, it was just like 10 times better than the one I had. Uh, it had, you know, more than one pickup, so I was able yeah, to choose <laughs> different pickups. <laughs> um, but the one thing I remember, like, they, my parents in the beginning were like, you know, we're not going to get you, like, you know, any of these effects pedals that you're asking for because I wanted like some kind of like distortion pedal. Yeah, sure. They were, they were like, oh, you know, you got to get a little bit better, you know, and show that, you know, you, you deserve like, you know, something like that. And so for, you know, in the beginning, it was just like a lot of clean guitar trying to play stuff on the, <laughs> like with, with a clean sound. And then until later on, I got my first uh, distortion pedal, which was like a Metal Maniac by uh, FX. I forgot the name of the company, but it was okay. crappy ass. Oh, boss? No, no not Boss. It? it was like, I, I I don't remember the name of the actual company. I think it was FX or FX something, but it was a shitty ass <laughs> distortion <laughs> pedal. Um, but, you know, that's what I wailed on at that time. So it yeah. worked. It had its uses. Would you go to Bronin's? Yes. I, I was just going to say that I got well, my first bass in Bronin's. Yeah. I used to go to Bronin's with my dad when he used to go to pick uh, up his course, guitar strings. It's been around for like <laughs> yeah. more than 100 years. Still there. years now. Yeah. yeah, it's still there. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, and that's, that's where we nice. met Loki from District Nine yeah. and became Frank. Frank. Joe Rampage. Joe, you know Rampage. Joe Rampage. Yes, Joe yeah. Rampage. Did you yes. talk to Joe Rampage? I, I haven't yet. But Shout yeah. out to him. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, because yeah. he was he was an early influence on Definitely, us. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so was Loki. Sure. So was Frank. We wanted to be like because they were like ahead of us. Oh, like, a, little a little bit, little bit ahead, older, like a year or two right, right. ahead of us. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we were mesmerized, but by them gigging and doing the thing, right? Yeah. And we we wanted to get on that train. Yeah. So we would go to Bronin's and hang out and buy shit from there. Like I said, I bought my first bass there. It was an Ibanez. I couldn't tell you what the model was now. But sure. um, yeah, got it on Loki's recommendation. And yeah, that's the way we started. Bronin's was very, very instrumental yeah. in so, our, uh, our early days, for sure. <laughs> um, and, and Nanda, where would, you, where would you pick up music as far as albums and all those? Well, um... When I started buying, I guess, or asking my parents to buy me my, my records, the first place they took me was to um, Beat Street. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, which is Dr. J's now right, right. At, at Fordham. Right, yeah. which is in the basement yeah. of Beat Street. And, and yeah. there I picked up my, I, I just see my first few um, vinyls, uh, the 598 EP. Uh-huh. Um, we all picked that up there in that yeah, fucking definitely. store. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, Slayer's like South of Heaven. Okay, South of Heaven, yeah. And Megadeth, so far, so good. So what? I think those are like so one of the first. first yeah. Right. Uh, and then, of course, I kept going back and, you know, and buying sure. more stuff. Um, but th that was pretty much the, the main place that I knew of, yeah. like in my neighborhood, to, to, to get like that kind of music. Yeah. And it's probably the only place in the Bronx that you could get that because, let's be real, yeah. Bronx is engulfed in hip hop and Spanish culture uh -huh. and that music. So there was little room for metalheads. Like we, we know all the fucking metalheads in the Bronx back then because there yeah. were so few of us. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. You know, so we were like a little community. But there, Beat Street hooked it up, and that shop on Valentine were the two spots. Uh, That's it. Uh, I didn't see anything anywhere else that I went in yeah. the Bronx. Um, and and Nando, uh, talk a little bit more about some of your first shows. I mean, I know the Danzig show was your first. Uh, How was that? And what were some of the other ones you went to? Well, um. The Dandic show, um, my dad took me because my mom was just, you know, didn't want me to go to shows at, at that young age. Yeah. I think I was 16 years old. Okay. Um, it was a great experience. Never heard music be played that loud. 
<laughs> like I told you before about how my dad used to blast the radio in yeah, the car. Sure. This was like a hundred times louder. Wow. Um, and uh, just I was kind of like mesmerized by like you know like John Christ uh, playing the guy uh, the, the old guitarist uh-huh. from Danzig. Um, and the way like the guitars came across the PA it was just like wow, and I, I could just feel the the, mm-hmm. the kick drum in my whole body. It was just such a fantastic experience. Yeah. And I, I think I, I probably got in the pit a couple of times, you know, just to, you know, you know, dip my toe in sure. a little bit. Yeah. You know, um, um, but it was a great experience. And, you know, my daddy, you know, he was a hip dude. So like, you know, he, he was totally digging it, you know? Yeah. Um, and after that, you know, my mom started to relax and, you know, let me, you know, go to the shows with these guys. Um, it's kind of a blur of like what specific shows I went to after that. Sure, sure, but sure. I know, I, you know, I definitely like, seen like uh maybe like biohazard um who the hell else fury of five back then fury of five but i don't think i'm thinking but that's later like, yeah, yeah but then i'm that's thinking later. like a lot, a lot of the, oh, first yeah, yeah. The, from that era um the white zombie show i remember oh, that at the wolf's land yeah. um gore sure that was another early show that was an awesome one of the best experiences yeah sure um did you guys used to i guess it might be later on Guys go to like the Super Bowl of hardcore. That was no, later. That's much that was later. later. Much later from that, yeah. Yeah. Was, at that time, it was like mostly like you know metal. Yeah, more metal stuff. than anything else. Yeah, sure. Um, Yuvi, do you want to talk about getting into drums and how all of that played out in your life? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> so drums actually came a little late. Um, oh, okay, okay. Considering you know what most people's stories uh, are usually like. Um, I was definitely into guitar first and foremost and, and had uh, a bunch of guitars and, you know, I, like Phil said, I definitely emulated, you know, the James Hetfield, got a couple of, of those guitars, actually, the uh, Gibson Explorer. Um, and I guess it was also because it was, well, like my brother played guitar. Oh, and I let's be real, I mean, it's a lot easier to get into guitar, like it's easier to convince your parents or... Oh, for me, it was like, I think it was my bar mitzvah money that I yeah. blew on on the Gibson, which sure. I still have. Um, and, you know, it's just less to buy, less room you need, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, but, you know, in, in the back of my head, uh, I was interested in drumming. Um, like, the first uh, couple of bands I was in, whenever the drummer would you know, we'd be taking a break, whatever. I'd literally put the guitar down and like run to the drum set. Uh-huh. Um, I think it was all, it's all the, uh, it's all the videos, like the MTV videos, yeah. just like obsessing and, and like watching the drummer back there. And uh-huh. just from, you know, the visuals, I was able to, to t- take, take my cue on like, okay, well, here's where the right hand goes. Here's, and, um, so yeah, so it's almost like I knew how to play before I had a drum set. I also remember, yeah, yeah, I remember this. I'd, I'd go to like Guitar Center, or, like, was it Guitar Center or Sam Ash? Sam Ash, maybe. Sam like in Ash, Long Island, maybe. my mom would take me to Sam Ash in Huntington. Okay. Um, you know, like I said, I whisked away to the suburbs. I had no friends, so the only thing I would ask her to do was like, you know, take me to the record store, take me to the Sam Ash. And I'd go back and and hit the uh, the you know the electric kit. Yeah. Um, I guess I it seemed a little more acceptable sure. to make noise on the drums, and I wasn't as confident with the guitar to play because these other guys were playing all this stuff. And I'm like, what am I gonna do? Go and play like bar chords and bar chords. <laughs> <laughs> so the drums is just you know I didn't even I didn't care. I just yeah. I loved it so much. I didn't I wasn't self conscious about it. Sure. Um, but yeah, so I got my first kit uh, at sixteen. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, I was in I was in my second band with a couple of guys from the Dwight School. I so the, I mentioned uh, Night Stalker, uh-huh. which is uh, Chris Demore, and and Steve Varconi, aka SV. Uh, he was the singer. Chris was a guitarist. There was a couple other uh, characters, um, shall I yeah. say? Oh yeah, Tommy and Armando Lopez. So uh, we started a band. We were called Unknown. Unknown, okay. And we were based in Brooklyn, so I'd lug, you know, 
my stuff there. But at first, I was actually a guitar player. And <clears throat> I think like our second rehearsal or first rehearsal, this drummer that we had lined up they didn't show up. Yeah. And um, I, you know, I had my guitar with me, and uh, I was like, I can go back there. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I played, and these guys are like, you're the drummer now. And that was <laughs> that's pretty much history. But um, we, uh, yeah, we were like kind of ahead of the curve a little. We were we were like a true death metal hardcore mix. Ah, okay. Um, okay. I mean, there was already yeah. like Inhuman was already doing that. Sure. Not Inhuman. I'm sorry. I was thinking of Mar uh, Mike Scandato. Uh, what band was he in? Uh, Confusion. Confusion. Confusion, Confusion was already yeah, was already that time, doing yeah. that. Um, there was the dude from Marauder, Jorge's Jorge. first band, Full, Full Contact. Contact. Yeah, there were yeah. bands doing that, yeah. but they were kind of like I wouldn't say they were our peers because they were older than us. Yeah, but sure. but we were we were part of that scene and it influenced us. Um, but I think we were more death metal than, nice. than those bands, nice. but we didn't, it fizzled out. I mean, we yeah, recorded sure. a demo, um, but we were quite a group of characters and we weren't destined to <laughs> have um, a long career yeah. for sure. And what happened was, um, well, I guess this is just the drumming part, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's how I pretty much got into drumming. I mean, uh, it was something I knew I was always going to do, but yeah. it was kind of also by accident. And then at 16, which is after all this, um, I actually finally convinced my pops at, uh, to, to get me a drum set. Uh, and um, he had already gotten divorced from the stepmother. So I see. Uh, for, you know, for, for high school... My house was like a bachelor pad. I mean, yeah. it was just my dad there. And so this was the opportunity to, to get a drum set, right? Because it's like, there's no there's no naggy mom or stepmom. <laughs> uh, my brother was already like out of the house. It was just me and him. And uh, I guess it was finally the time. And so he bought me uh, on 48th Street, uh, Manny's Music or Sam Ash, one of those. Uh, Tama. Rockstar DX, five hundred dollars, I think, for the the five piece. Yeah. You even get symbols with it or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I still have that kit. Oh wow! Yeah, I don't use it, but uh, <laughs> I have it. And that was my first drum set, and I used that drum set for the irate demo ninety six. Demo ninety six. Yeah, wow. That's, that's the okay. only. It's the only bit of irate um, recording that that made it on. I see. But. Um, that's how that's how the drumming began. Yeah, could you more or less immediately do blast beats when you when you first got behind the camera? <laughs> um, I don't. I don't think. Uh, maybe. Yeah, uh, I'm unknown had blast beats. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I read really didn't have like a yeah, lot. Yeah, sure, sure, We sure. had a couple of little. I mean, I appreciated blast beats, but I don't think I, I don't really like playing blast beats. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I don't consider you know in terms of playing, I don't consider myself uh like this really fast. You know, overly you know technical drummer. I'm more about groove sure. and feel and stuff <laughs> like that, and yeah. uh, being in the moment more. Sure. But um, but yeah, I could. I guess I did some blast beats right off the bat. They weren't very good. <laughs> and then these this day and age, the the kids are doing. I know. Like stuff that uh, last. I don't even. I mean, I don't even necessarily. Well, I shouldn't say I don't like it. Arc Spire is pretty damn oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you you were starting to get into, I think maybe how you met the uh, yeah my rate. Right? Yeah, so with so the band out. unknown was like a couple guys from Dwight, yeah. but then I was I, I befriended uh, Nick, yeah. who's our uh, our our rhythm guitar player, um, and we hung out and stuff, and um, he. Mean, yeah. Just, uh, you know, uh, at the Dwight School, I guess it was more like hanging out, nice. getting high, yeah, you know, sure. smoking pot, sure. you know, drinking, stuff like that. Um, that was, I mean, we obviously had the music connection. He, yeah. He'd wear the whatever metal shirt and, hey, you know, plus he had long hair. I had long hair. Uh -huh. you know, we knew. Yeah. <laughs> he just, sure. we're like, what's up, dude? <laughs> um, but, uh, 
you know, Nick was a little more reserved than a lot of like the friends I had had, you know, who were, you know, rowdy and, you know, just uh, really out more outgoing. Um, and uh, I knew he played guitar, but like, I think because I was busy with the band and stuff, he wasn't always like approaching me at that time. And he was busy with other things and he had went away for a little while and we lost contact. You know, there was no social media or cell phones. He had a beeper. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I think we, we reconnected after the, the unknown band had finished and, um, or he wanted to jam. He had some songs. Nick was, you know, Nick's a great songwriter. And so, he, he always has material, so I believe I, had, you know, he came up to the Bronx where I had my drum set at the uh, Bachelor Pad. Uh-huh. You know, we could smoke pot in the room, cigarettes, and uh, it was a, it was a free for all. It was a good place to it to be cool free. You know, uh, bless my dad's heart for that. Where um, where what intersection was that? So yeah, the the it was two hundred fifty fourth Street, Arlington Avenue. Oh okay, so, so, so yeah, we had a, we had a private house that yeah. was, you know, across the street from a, an apartment building and yeah. other homes that we, you know, they had to endure a lot of. They didn't um, like him very much. <laughs> yeah, they, they had to endure them. a lot of noise <laughs> and metal on Saturdays and, and I guess mainly on the weekends, right? At that time. Yeah. Um, so, well, yeah, so Nick came up and we jammed. It was just me and him. Uh, the song that he had first was uh, Step to My World. Right. Oh, okay. And we had jammed that a bunch. And there were probably other st- other songs too, but that one I remember clearly. And I, I always liked recording everything. And I had this like s- just yellow Sony boombox that had a recording function okay. and it was one of those sony's where it was like waterproof yeah the the, the, the waterproof walkman the waterproof and uh it was bad but i mean it had a mic on it so we i'd set it up like far away from like even outside of the room just because we were so loud and it would uh distort uh into the mic so we recorded that we even jammed that a little bit with uh this one of the singers from unknown armando uh from unknown we had two singers on that band and um so it was kind of i believe it was already happening i mean you guys weren't even in that picture at the time it was um but it wasn't irate it wasn't like you didn't have a name no it was just us jamming yeah well what i mentioned it was like a side thing it was a side thing for me, so unknown was still Un- unknown was kind of still like active, main, and, and, yeah. and you kind of like just starting like the side thing with Nick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and when I went to his place, it was uh, under the guise of seeing like, we could recruit him into the band that I was playing at that time. Oh. We yeah. So him. basically, what happened was I I went to after Dwight, I went to Kennedy High School in the Bronx, uh-huh. and um, we had some mutual friends. Um, I mean, I didn't know these guys, but, yeah. um, so it was rich, uh, no, well, but not the same rich you guys are talking about. Rich. It was a well, different, it was George, George, sorry. And Omar, sorry, George, <laughs> George and Omar. Yeah. Who I, I was friends with, um, metal and just hanging out. And I think it was one day where we, I cut Kennedy and yeah. went over to Clinton Yeah, and just casually met Nando. I don't think, you That's know, right. we were discussing playing or anything. They were just hanging out. I don't know, you know, don't remember too much. But um, so George, I think, really wanted to play in the band with me. And he had come by to jam, but also brought Nando. Right? Well, that the he, story? No. Is, mind you, this is... George was in our band. And... and and oh, he's like, I know hey, this guy that plays right, drums. So, right, well, uh, so you're trying to recruit me? Insane. Well, at George. the time, I think. Well, Phil wasn't in in the band. He had departed at that time. Yeah. Um. I. I. We might have gone on to a different name. I don't. I don't oh, remember. Okay. 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 Yeah, yeah. But um, you know, we were on the search for a drummer, and George was like, "Yeah, you know, I know this guy, Kennedy. You know, he's a good drummer. You know, maybe we can go to his house and play with him and see if we can get him in there." Yeah. So, um, one day I you know, go to to the house. Um, we kind of hit it off because I, I was all automatically just impressed with his drumming. Yeah. 
Like, I don't think I've seen anybody at that time that, that played that well. And I was kind of shocked when he said, oh, I just started playing like a year or two ago. Uh, what were you, like 16 <laughs> Especially or somebody like local. I mean, yeah, it must have been. And drummers are so, so hard to come yeah, back to. And this guy had his own, you know, pad. And, you know, he play as loud as he wanted. So you can Damn. smoke weed in here. Yeah. smoke weed. <laughs> well, it was a dream. At that time, I wasn't smoking weed. <laughs> okay, but, okay, yeah. um, it was really exciting. That changed Maybe quickly, though. It did. <laughs> I was excited to probably, you know, try to get in the band. But um, I remember at the end of the session, you know, he just laid it out. He was like, yeah, you're not really looking <laughs> to join another band, you know, because I got my band unknown. And I'm also working on this other project with my friend. So, uh, um, you know, I'm not really looking at you know. So we were like, all right, whatever. But then a day or two later, he gave me a call. Uh, One of the guys gave him my number. And then he, you know, briefly told I me about. Because I, I mentioned to Nick. I was like, yo, I just found this awesome guitar player, and I don't know, he plays like Metallica flawlessly. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's the, the the behind the scene part that he didn't see uh, or know about. And then I was like, you know, we'll recruit him into our thing. I mean, I think by then uh, the unknown stuff was was pretty fizzled out. I mean, I wouldn't have been doing both because anyway you know they they would have been like hey, fuck you you're doing another band i think that band was already like done um so yeah so that's how well, essentially yeah, well, so we i linked came up. over mm -hmm. met nick um they showed me their stuff yeah um i was totally like, really into it i like the songwriting like i thought like had it like a real good you know like the songs were well, well written and um you know, when they asked if I wanted, you know, to join, I was like, yeah, you know, maybe I could do this in the other band at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, but it didn't turn out like that, though, because um, when I went back to the other guys, they were like, oh, all right, whatever. So, like, they kind of, like, just fizzled out. And so, like, I see. this project that I, that I started with, Yubi and Nick, was kind of like the, 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 the shit. And then, a little after that, um, we were looking for a vocalist. So I went to Phil, and I was like, "Yo, I'm playing with these guys. That you know, they're this really hard, you know, band, and then they they know their shit, and and we need a vocalist." Yeah. Because I was I was uh, I remember telling them, "I know this guy that's got like, a real amazing voice, and I think he'd be great for us." And then um, went back to Phil, who was into it, came. And he just impressed everybody. It was just, it was a wonderful thing. <laughs> Didn't you walk in and say something oh, yeah. incredibly you know what? confident? <laughs> What'd you say? You like walked in. Like, Your new singer's here. Or some <laughs> shit like that. Yeah, it was some. It was Listen, I was young and cocky as fuck, man. Like, you kind of got to be in this music. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, like my shit didn't stink, you know. And uh, yeah, that I said something stupid like that, and uh, they just laughed, and we started jamming. They gave me the lyrics to um, uh, "Step to My World," and okay, Nick yeah. and I sat in the corner, kind of just went over it, and yeah, I tried it, and it. I did my best Juan Brujo impression because Juan Brujo was the shit to me at that time. And uh, a little bit of DSI, try to mix sure. both those voices. I always thought of you as having a, a lot of the Max Cavalera. Oh, yes. Well. That too. Yeah. Because Max like Cavalera it. is one of the most important yeah. influences of my voice. Was one yeah. thing, one 100%. thing that... Uh, so I try to emulate those three individuals <laughs> in one, sure. right? Yeah. I wasn't very great at it at first, but I was good enough to... Get in a band, yeah, and you know that's what happened. Like that very afternoon, I was in the band. I see. Yeah, and did you all have a bassist yet? At that no, point? Uh, we even started the... playing shows without a bass yeah. player. Your bass, bass has always been like, oh, yeah. A, yeah, you know, uh, shaky ground uh, position that we've yeah. always had. I mean, we had some more solid effort from later on, and then you know, uh, with, with with Nick's brother Curtis. Yep. But I mean, we we had stints where we played shows without a bass player, all sorts of stuff. Oh, but I see. Um, and not not that that's good. But um, yeah, you had to do it. We, we had we no had choice. To, like yeah. they well, weren't you know, available. <laughs> one thing that always made it feel okay was like Candiria yes. played shows without. Uh, yeah, early yeah, yeah. Candiria we did it without. Candiria too. does it yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, and then we met this kid named Jason Robles, uh -huh. uh, aka J Ray. Sure. Uh, and he was like this straight edge, 
dude, which was the opposite of us. <laughs> so he was always he was always mad at us. I was smoking uh, weed at Yeah, time. we were smokers. <laughs> and he'd be in there like, oh, oh. cigarettes. Everybody. But you know, he we still got along enough that he wanted to be part of the band. Yeah. Um, and so he was our first bass player. Uh, yeah. I see, yeah. I see. And before he joined, did you all already have the name I rate? And how yeah, we did, yeah. how did you come up with yeah. that name? I mean, maybe it just... Just one day in the mm-hmm. rehearsal studio uh, or in his house. Well, um, no, I think, uh, yeah. So in Step to My World... Don't we'll start because I'm irate. Yeah, that's how it started. The first line of the song. I was like, and I don't know who pointed that out, that, yeah, that it should go... It was probably Nick, though. Yeah. Um, like, yeah. Uh, it was Nick, and then he I just put even, that out there. We were I didn't like, even know that word until that point. <laughs> Me neither. It's like, what is that? Because <laughs> you know, I, I I heard that you you know heard a new metal band called Irate and said, yeah, we're gonna take that name. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's exactly how it happened. Um, so yeah, Nick blurted it out one day uh, just because it was a lyric in our song. Yeah, and it stuck. Like yeah. we. We'd come up with so many stupid fucking names. It was ridiculous. Do you remember any of the stupid ones? Those are always fun. Uh, I remember one, but it's too offensive um, <laughs> to mention at this point. So it, 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 it compassed our racists. <laughs> remember that? Yes, I do. I can't say. I don't know. Off camera, that, absolutely. Was that then? Or yeah, that? it was. Oh, yeah, it was. Uh, and that, that was like, not that it was going to be the name, but it was yeah, something we floated around for I mean, a little yeah, while. The truth is, is that it, KSN? It, 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 uh, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was cool because it showed the diversity of the band. Yeah. Yep. You know, absolutely. Me, yes. me being Jewish, Nick. Uh, being uh, a white, Irish, I guess, Irish, Irish yeah. white, part German, and part the German. Puerto Ricans, and then Jay. Well, Jay, Jay, Jay was, was Puerto, Puerto Rican and black. He's just very dark skinned. Yeah, so. I see. Well, his dad was black. Oh, he was. Yeah. There you go. That explains that. But, so we um, had it all in the band. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? What attracted us about Phil was, um, like I said, Nick and my some of my death metal crew buddies. You know that he didn't always jive with them sure um you know not that he didn't like them or anything but he i don't think he was into it as much he was more into thrash and stuff and so when phil came in you know we were looking for somebody who wouldn't just straight up be uh incoherent in terms of like you know ability to uh to to do the vocalization so phil brought the the element that was like balanced perfectly where it was it was heavy as fuck and, and all that but you know, it had a bit of uh, that thrash element, yeah. um, which we like. Because the hardcore style vocals were, were good, but it wasn't what we wanted. Because we always felt that we were metal more than anything else. Yeah. yeah. So, which has always kind of been, you know, we're too metal for hardcore. We're too hardcore for, for metal. metal shows. Yeah. We always, like, straddled the line. <laughs> yeah, we did. It made it challenging yeah. for us, but... Um, but I'm jumping a little bit. So we are on to J rate yep. and we were in my dad's uh, house. Yeah. We're jamming uh, every weekend. Uh, what did we end up doing? We ended up playing our first show. Oh yeah. Where was that at? Uh, Castle, Castle Heights. 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 Oh, at Castle. Oh, wow. Our okay. very so first ever. show ever was there. First of many. On a September in 1996. I can't, I don't remember uh, the day. But it was okay. September. Wait, but did we do the demo first, or did we play shows no, first? No, I think we did the demo after. That's how I remember. I don't know. I but we had material, obviously. But we had material. Yeah, but sure. not much. Sure. No, we had Only maybe three, like four, four songs. Maybe songs. four songs. Okay. Five at the most, I think. Yeah. And unbeknownst to us, you know, Castle Heights would be our... Uh, would become our home. home our Queen's home away yeah. from yeah. the Bronx. Yeah. Do you remember what other shows were on the bill with you? Or, I mean, what other bands were on the yes, bill with you then? Yes, I do. Yeah. Oh, no. uh, so there was a band called Trauma. Okay. They didn't last very long. Um, but I remember them being on the on the bill. And then a band that would come, our friends, for a long time and still, uh, Dehumanized. Oh, okay. Dehumanized okay. was like a slam, the fir- one of the first slam bands. Yeah. Uh, where they mixed the, the death metal bug with a lot of breakdowns. Sure. Um, and we were, I was floored by them when I, when I first saw them, I was like, we got to follow this. And yeah. shit, like, oh shit, we better bring it. Yeah. 
Um, and our first show, I remember uh, the week before the show, anytime I thought of the lyric, I wanted to throw up. That's how nervous I was. <laughs> <laughs> like, I could not get it, my shit together that week. And the, the anxiety was through the roof. Yeah. And then even when we're on or we're going to be on, I was like, oh, my God, I got to throw up. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't until they started playing yeah. that just something happened in my brain, like a switch or whatever the fuck. And I was, and, and I got confident. The confidence came, and the rest is history. But up until then, if I if I uttered "Don't start because I'm irate," but mm-hmm. I wanted to throw up. <laughs> so so it was weird, man. But like uh, once we got that first one out of the way, I knew this is what I wanted to do for forever. Yeah, yeah, you know. So was this was this the very first show for all of you? You already played shows in that. No, bands, for, right? for him and I, well, first show. I don't know about I you. Mean, I mean, I, I, yeah, yeah you, you be playing. I did have experience. You know, playing like school band shows oh, and stuff okay, like that, sure, and performing sure, sure. in front of people. So sure. you know, it wasn't uh, yeah, as I'm as uh, you know uh, nerve wracking. Yeah, he was brave enough to get into the auditorium of a talent show at Kennedy That's High School oh, and play to yeah, all these oh, hip hop kids. Wow, who yeah, weren't too thrilled about it, yeah, you know, because yeah, yeah, they weren't yeah, into yeah, rock. Yeah, yeah sure. And we, um, we yeah. performed Enter Sandman. Yes, yes. Oh boy! <laughs> and yes. I remember we had somebody that was going to do the vocals. Yeah. Um, actually, this was, this was like, I will, in the, the lead up to the show, you know, to see if we, we can get on the show. And the guy that was going to do the vocals, he like, he was kind of sucking. So I kind of just like, you yep. know, say your prayers. He, he, he did it all. And, and all that stuff. He James did. Yeah. And, wow. and, and he had like a full band, drums and everything. It was, well, it was two guitars, drummer. I'm not sure if we had a bassist. Uh, but basis yeah. problem back then and then we did the show I, you know I thought it sounded you know pretty good uh, a lot of booze yeah he gets a lot of booze <laughs> and, and he, he stops by going fuck you yeah. <laughs> and he <laughs> loved, <laughs> yeah. so legendary wow I mean, yeah look, uh, back then uh, there was a big divide between huge, huge. hip hop metal rock I mean uh-huh. in the Bronx forget about it especially I mean, you either listen to rap we were like aliens to these kids, nothing, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, kids walk around these days with the Metallica shirts, and so it's crazy. It's like I used to get made fun of or for that shit, yep. um, but it's cool. I mean, no, it's great. They're appropriating our culture, and a lot of cultures have been appropriated over the human history. So it's like, how can we sit here and you know make that one feel different it's, it's just the same shit but, huge um, shift because later now uh when my kid went to high school and he played his talent show they cheered him like he was fucking god yeah yeah and right? i'm like no they didn't get that and like <laughs> we didn't get that when we were, we were like pariahs yeah but he was like a hero after that yeah it's, it was it's, awesome it's it's weird that the different phases that you know that those kind of trends have gone through because mm-hmm. there's people just a little bit older than you all who seem to not encounter a whole lot of flack and people even enjoyed some of the music they played who weren't necessarily into it but then i know i mean i'm a little younger than you all but with me there's the same there was the same division very strict division between genres but now sure. it doesn't seem to mixed. be the case yeah no, it's yeah. all mixed i mean look it's it's good yeah because that's right. you know nando probably went home that night and cried in his room or <laughs> not i mean he turned off but he you know it, it gave it, it give you like it made you driven yep. to want to, yes oh yeah for me like, to go for all the no's and all the like you know you suck and all this stuff from family this that whatever uh society even uh made you want to do it more yeah but um so yeah i played shows with unknown a couple of shows not okay, many played a couple of shows. um interestingly enough though um my second show which was on house and street spiral just not the spiral, spiral which was, yeah. you know long gone yeah um i met martin there uh, i don't think he probably connected that it was me or whatever yeah. i realized later because i'd seen him Around. In you know around at other shows, but uh, go to Mentis played that show. They played at the Spiral. Yeah, and, and then, then we played, and um, so wow. Um, I'm not. I don't think we hit it off or whatever. But I remember seeing him, and he was a very recognizable guy. Yes. Different, you know, just just different. Oh, and yeah. like <laughs> you know, uh, it wasn't until later when Billy Club kind of came around that uh, around our lives um, that. 
I made the connection. I'm like, wait a second, I actually knew this dude before. But but that actually brings me back to like, you know, when I was going to these shows with with my crew at the time, uh, CBGBs, Candiria, um, just the whole New York scene. Um, I would, these guys were there, but yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, we didn't know each other. Uh-huh. Um, we had some, actually, we almost had beef once. Yeah. Oh, really? I, was, I had an issue with a kid. I had because an our crews, uh, my crew, one of the dudes in my crew had yeah. beef with him, and I was about, I was like, yo, what's up? So, what we got to do and all this stuff. A lot of these friendships were forged after duress. <gasps> sure. Right? So when me and him first met Martin, we were meeting him in some deaf stock show at Wetlands, uh-huh. And we were hitting each other pretty hard and giving each other the look, <laughs> right? So at some point, we step up to, to him, and he, and he comes up to us, and we just start laughing because it's just <laughs> stupid. And we've been friends ever fucking since. Now, I met him one time before that, but we didn't like UV. We didn't, like, have a yeah, no. connection that, yeah, sure, sure, you sure. know, it was just like we were in the same room having fun. Yeah. But that day, he was on some shit, and we were like, I'm going to fuck this guy up. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> And vice versa, he was thinking yep. the same thing, yep. and, and and it just came together, and we just started laughing. And Did you end up like beating up? Omar? But with them, so with them, yeah, that's what... so this kid, they knew I had a huge issue with, yeah, and he had an issue with me. So we go to CBG, these we're dancing. He's kind of coming into me, but I'm not moving because again, you know, cocky show? fuck. What uh, show is this? Uh, I don't remember which. I think it was maybe Candy. Uh, yeah, it was Candy. Uh, it had to be if we were at CBG. Yeah. So he comes in and I just push him and then we go to it. But I didn't know later on that they were going to jump my ass for that. (laughs) And he was stuck in the middle because he was friends with both. And it was weird for him. But like I had it. Yeah, tune I, this I, kid up, I, and I that's what I did. You became, I, I, you came to me, you called me, and you were like, "Yo, man, your boy's lucky, man. We're gonna fuck him up." And I was like, oh man, dude, come on, yo. And the crews I was with were no joke. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. When when we met these guys, um, like Nick and I, like, yeah. we kind of like tarnished them a little bit because they were, even though they were into metal, hanging out, and they were, you know, they're from obviously like rougher neighborhoods than where I grew up. Yeah. Um, but uh, even though we're all from the Bronx, um, these guys were goody goodies. I mean, to <laughs> an extent, like they weren't to an really, extent. They weren't smoking. I'm not with them smoking pot. And these and um me and Nick kinda introduced them to a lot of this like just, you know, all this stuff. Um, all these naughty things. Yeah, all these naughty But we things. weren't herbs. If no, someone challenged him or hurt, me, but... we would fuck them up. But, and that was um, <laughs> so like, but yeah, we he, were very innocent. You know, he had it coming, so he's lucky. I don't know what stopped it, but um, you lucky, lucky <laughs> kid. <laughs> Thank you. Up. But um, um, it all ended up all right. Yeah. But um, this brings me back to even the more interesting story, the... Uh, the uh, you know the the connection here is even crazier than that because I was at a Yankee game. Yes, uh, yes. ninety five. Ninety five. Okay. I'm, I'm at a Yankee game. I'm I'm smoking a joint in the uh, upper deck. old Yankee Stadium. Old Yankee Stadium. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and um, I get kicked out naturally. Um, <laughs> and. I ended up going back in because the bleachers were free that day, but that's besides the point. Um, so I'm telling a story about a, a, a rate rehearsal, one of our early rehearsals at years the uh, yeah. Yeah, year, a couple of years later, like two years later. I mean, uh, it wasn't, yeah. But so, uh, and I'm telling the story. I'm like, yeah, man, I was at the Yankee Steel. You kicked, they kicked me out. And I'm telling the story because Nando mentioned that he was a security guard at the stadium <laughs> for a year or so. And I'm like, yeah, that's funny. I got kicked out once. And he's like, wait a second. <laughs> I'm like, what were you, what shirt were you wearing? I'm like, wearing a bio shirt. <laughs> that was you? <laughs> this fucking guy kicked me out. He's like, did you put the joint under your foot? I'm like, yep, that was me. <laughs> and uh, he fucking kicked me out of Yankee Stadium. And then two years later, I'm smoking pot with him. Uh, and he's in the band. So go figure. What, was, wow, what yeah. a connection. Yeah. Yeah. Small world, my friends. Small like, world. I, I, I was 18, and I was uh, working security, and they, they had me on this, uh, what they called the squad. Okay. And and their basic purpose was, you know, if they, like a fight broke out or somebody needed to be escorted out of the building, 
like these were the guys that were you know would come along and, and do that and like, a lot of us were like you know, fairly big guys so i remember um my um supervisor got a call on the radio someone was spotted smoking a joint <laughs> And, um, <laughs> and I remember that they used to pull out their binoculars and, you know, just to spot the dude. And so we went over and it's him. And, um, was it, was it Steve Barconi or I forget who, or Armando? Yeah. It might've been Armando. I mean, at the time, like I didn't realize or know who he was. Um, and then my supervisor goes up to him and he's like, okay, where's the joint? And he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> And the guy was like, look, they spotted you smoking the joint. Like, where's the joint? And he was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then at some point, somebody was like, yo, check under his foot. And then they had him move his foot, and, and there was the joint. Lo and behold. That's amazing. Lo and behold. Does that ever get told that story? Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, so he has since rolled up a bunch of joints. <laughs> <laughs> So and we I, smoke on Yankee Stadium block, but we don't do it inside. <laughs> <laughs> um, so why don't you all talk about the 96 demo recording that? And Yeah, so that was um, a four-track. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rondo yeah, kind of led the way with the technical stuff. and Done in your bedroom. That was done in the, uh, <laughs> the infamous bedroom in the at bedroom. the house. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 254th Street, Arlington Avenue. Demo 96, I'm, I mean, I, I'm kind of light on the details about how we recorded it, but I'm thinking it was done live. Because, yeah, it was right, live, right? Because right? right? you got yes. like one yes. track is just drums and maybe the guitars, uh -huh. and then later on we used one track for vocals. <laughs> you only have four to uh -huh. work with. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. And um, it's no budget we, as it gets. Uh, uh -huh. Recorded that, and we would painstakingly. Well, Nick would. How would he make the copies it? and duplicate it and and make, put in right. the cassette? I mean, those, the oh my god! Yeah, I mean, I think the, 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 the later version you got, the more like degraded. But I mean, like Nick was definitely like led the way with like the business side of things sure. for most of our rate. I mean, sure. we did. Um, you know, he would, uh, he was pretty crafty. I think he had some stuff printed out that you needed to cut out. I mean, he would, like, do that by hand. And like, wow. Send it out to distros and... And load him thing. and I up with and copies then, and, to go yeah. Yeah. give away. Yeah, we would, you know, go to record stores, yeah. all the old school stuff that, like, nobody sure. does these days. Sure. So shows and... Yep. Um, in the days of writing letters, yeah, right. well, no, well, no, well, yeah, I mean, Nick would send it out to letters. yeah, <laughs> <That's right>. European <laughs> distros sure. and stuff like that. They would respond a week or two weeks later with a letter, and then you, you know, and he did that a lot. And credit to him for all that because um, he was really good at you know at what it, what what he did considering the tools he had to work with. Oh, definitely. Um, and uh, actually, Nick was smart enough to mail himself yes, he one of those. Ah, he mailed us all copies. Yeah, yeah, un yeah, unopened mail, postal ah, seal, ah. just to sort of give it a stamp to the date. Yep. Which, you know, as we have some people know, uh, would be uh, important once we faced um, copyright issues. Sure, sure. Um, but, uh, look, he was always really smart business-wise. I mean, we're all degenerates, let's yeah. be real here, and yeah. love to hang out hard. He was a structure. Like, but out of all of us, yeah. you know, early on, he was, um, he was good like that. So that demo, you know, got us a lot of uh, notoriety locally. I mean, sure. Castle Heights played shows. We did everything you're supposed to do. Yeah, I got which, that demo played in every club in New York. Like, wet wow. I man, CBs, they all played it. And it's shitty. Wow. It's a shitty. It was terrible. I mean, record recorded on four. <laughs> but they, you know. But hey, I approach people and they hooked it, it up, free. and that was yeah. it. Did it for yeah. free. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess that's it with that demo, right? I mean, that sort of we were hungry after that to yeah, record sure. for real. Right. Yeah. Um, and um, well, we got offered the um, what was the name of that compilation? Oh, that's right, a new found hope. hope. Oh, new found hope. Okay. But we had already been gigging. Right. So that's important but to say that. Yeah. The new fond hope is when, yes. we, when we met John Christoph. 
Yes. Who, who would record? Who would go on to record all, all the irate all stories? Ah, I see. So that's how you met him. And, and, uh, and the guy who okay. was running that uh, compilation, his name was Greg DeMack. Okay. And I forget where he lived, but he put this together. I think Queens dude. Oh, I think it was. It might have been. It, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but he would get the locals, and he did at least two of them. I see. Uh, and we were on the Newfound Hope one. And uh, I forget what other bands were on there, but I think Blackout was one. Oh, Blackout, okay. Um, I don't know if BCS was on that one or the other one, but they were. Was it called First Amendment or something? First Amendment. New yeah. Found Hope, I guess, was. So we got. Label he was so we went to record it. specifically for that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was our, and we recorded, re-recorded "Step to My World." Ah, uh, I see. For Burden. For for that. Oh, for that. For that. Oh, oh yeah. right, you're right. Yeah, Not yeah. on Burden. My bad. Uh, Transcendence? And maybe, I don't know if it was Transcendence or Bad Vibes. Bad Might have been vibe. Vibes. The only song I wrote on guitar fully uh, is it? and where the name Vibes comes from. Uh, oh, that's where. Uh, so that's some history there. Uh, maybe just like, the main riff. Yeah, just the main like riff. So, so, well, yes, Nick uh, did the intro. Did the intro riff uh, and then I did the rest. Because it was just no, a repeat. No, no, no. Like, from what I remember. Maybe, maybe. That's all me. He wrote dun, 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 that part, and the breakdown was mine too. Yeah. Well, the ending was his too. Hey man, there's no breakdown without drums. No breakdown without drums. But anyway, I wrote the majority of that song. Sure. And added some riffs to other things that that we wrote, but yeah. Yeah, I mm. forgot where I was going with this. What was the question? Well, <laughs> so yeah, New Found, found Hope. Oh, New Found Hope, yes. So those are the songs that made it there. And someone said to me, yo, you should be Phil Vibes. And that and was stuck. the birth of that. That stuck. Yeah. Um, so what What are some of the other places that you all were playing around this time? Obviously, Castle Heights. Regularly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But other so, venues. Uh, we did play. get to play Spiral at some point. Spiral. Right? Spiral. Uh, we uh, we Spiral? did play Wetlands. We okay. played Seabees. But that's later on. We though, played though. Coney Island. Yeah, but Coney he, Island. he was right. asking the New York mm -hmm. spot. Yeah. All the classic. All the classic Seabees. New York venues we played. Okay. Even like. Even Limelight. Limelight, okay, sure, sure, um, sure. The Pyramid. Pyramid, uh, yep. Lemours. Played Lemours. Lemours. The Lemours. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, they moved across the street. Mm -hmm. uh, we played out in Bayside, which was uh, oh, uh, Voodoo Lounge. Voodoo Lounge. Oh, Voodoo Lounge. Yeah. Um, there's probably a whole bunch of others where not. The oh, Black Thorn. Oh, the Black Thorn. Right down the, the street road. from oh, here. Black Thorn. Yes, sir. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, like, this, this yes. is a Bronx thing, right? Yeah, so which, which, which I could walk but to. you know what? Surprisingly, we didn't have a lot of, a lot of venues, uh, right? places to play, nor did we have a lot of uh, support that was, like, you know, like, consistently Bronx related, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, that was always the problem with the borough with this form of music, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, it wasn't until later on when you had, you know, your time at the Judas Syndrome that, you know, that church on uh, east side of the Bronx, uh -huh. that scene kind of developed. Underground. Yeah, Bronx yeah underground. I mean, we would have done great. quite yeah. well yeah. there, it but we were late. already, you know, our demise was already. Yeah, Ray had already place. broken up and I had started my second band. Yeah, yeah, and that yeah. was our first show. Yeah. And um well, great, a lot of young the, kids. The guy who ran that venue, one of the guys, his name is Adam Fackler, shout out to uh -huh. Adam. Um and ended up uh just doing doing really well there. And he graduated to Live Nation, so he's a big wig yep. there now. Uh and he played a, a bit in Judas Syndrome also. So he's a oh. former bandmate and one of the most solid That's dudes cool. ever. Mm -hmm. Uh wow. so yeah, shout out to him on that. Uh, but yeah, there, that, that came later. Like yes, sir. during our career, it was those clubs we mentioned. Yeah, earlier. luckily all and the... backyards. And backyards. Which, which and backyards. backyard parties did you all play? At? Uh, so we did a few. Our second, our second, our show, second was show was in a backyard, backyard in the Bronx, um, South play? Bronx. Oh, okay. I can't Soundview. tell you where. Was it? Maybe Soundview Sound area. Hoe Avenue or I couldn't. I know there were shows at Hoe Avenue. I couldn't remember. Yeah. But we were <laughs> on our second show. My buddy Will booked us. Will Blackout. Oh, okay. Okay. From my yeah yeah. And you know, because we were friends and whatever, and he wanted to help us out. He listed us as Iraq. Oh, I heard <laughs> Yeah. Ramon yeah. was telling me about that. So we were, we were Iraq that <laughs> evening. And it was the evening that Tupac, either Tupac died or Cobain died. One of those two died. Uh, um, maybe Cobain. 
and uh, it was definitely a, a crazy night. But we had fun, man. And those those shows, and then we played another one somewhere in the Bronx. They were they were all South Bronx. Yep. Um, did that, you know, barbecue stuff. Sure. Black, we... Black Thorn was, um, you know, a small bar, but we managed to. I think we had a show there that, you know, uh, in the later years would be like unheard of. Yeah. Um, unheard of, and the lineup could be at insane. Hammerstein Ballroom. Uh, yeah. Like, we, like, we, I got we Jamie Habry uh, to come to the Bronx, yeah. and I got Candiria. Wow. Because they mean, were friends, yeah, at the, yeah. you know, and they're lifelong friends. That but was at like, the Blackthorn. Huh? At the Blackthorn. Yeah, but right. I got them to come down to that. So I rate, <laughs> restrain, Haybreed, Candiria. Wow. That was, that was cool to see to see that happen. Wow. I mean, even then. But yeah. when you think about it, you're like, these guys are like, Haybreed's a national act. Uh -huh. To have them play down the road here, uh, it's quite a... Uh, uh, or a cool thing to have happen. For like a hundred wow. bucks I gave Jamie I mean, that night. Like, it's it's insane. Wow. And he's like, a millionaire now, you know? That, I mean, that's practically like the level of sick of it all playing Malali. Yes. Which he and I went to. Oh, uh, you all. Okay. You all oh, yeah. We were, so do, we were, we're supposed to do security. Well, that's where we yeah, met. That, that was supposed to be our first show. Oh. But something happened and Frankie couldn't hook it up. Frankie was one of the bookers of it. Yeah. Frankie Fahrenheit. Yeah. And he came to us. Uh, Joe Rampage. And Joe Rampage. And they were like, sorry, guys, Our we just can't. Our first show? Or... Yeah. No, no. We'll... It would have been. For a show. No, it would have been oh. Irate's first show. Oh. Wow. But a week before, he was like, I can't accommodate it. I got sick of it all coming down and no redeeming and all. District 9. So it's a lot of bands. And we were bummed. Yeah. And he was like, but do you want to do security? And I was like, sure. I guess. <laughs> so we did security for that show. I... Isn't that, that's where we met Jay Ray. At least where I uh, met Jerry and Malala. Well, Blackout definitely played. Yeah, out. Blackout played. Oh, so, Blackout played yeah, so it makes sense that we would have met Jerry. Mm -hmm. Wow. I think I think Lenny was telling me yes, Mountain Dew maybe was a sponsor. And they had a few sponsors. Like these young yeah. kids kept throwing yeah. Mountain Dew bottles or something. It was naughty, but for a Bronx show that was unheard of back then, yep. a big show like that. Yeah, that's insane. Yeah. It was probably the biggest show in the Bronx. Ever. Yep. Yep. Uh, having sick of it all come down here and do the thing for mm -hmm. for for New York hardcore. Yep. Um, and it gave a face to the Bronx finally. Yeah, sure. You know that there was a stop or there was a possible place to play shows. Like they also had the Home Depot, uh, not the Home Depot, the train, the train depot. Yep. And that was that was that already closed down by the time I race started playing or? Yeah, I like. Yeah, because we never like played that. Yeah. Boulevard. Like that, uh, that, it's that, Boy, it was by the six trains. So Williams Bridge. And, yeah. Oh, uh, I forget the cross. Lighting, I think. Mm. Um, yeah. But we saw a bunch yeah. of shows there. Yeah. You know? like, I know. Did, all you Out know, War, I saw. No Redeeming there. Yeah. yeah Go to Mantis played there. Go to Mantis. Yeah. Um, I think Billy Club did. Uh, what about, um, did you all ever play, there, there was like, it was a practice space, but also there are a few shows there. Um, yes. Helen Parkway. I know what you're talking about. We didn't play there, but I, I attended shows there. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. And the only I saw uh, Billy Club there. Oh yeah, yeah. Billy Club played. Yeah. The only other one I've heard of is the Blue Frog, which just had a few shows. It was right by Woodlawn there uh, under the Ford Trail. Yep. yep. Uh, we didn't play there, but I know Go to Mentis yeah. did. Yep. And District Nine. That was yeah. when we were in high school. Right? Yeah, we were in high school. When right? you all were in high school. Yeah. I see. Um, so, do you all want to talk more about what all was going on? Um, with the band, like leading up towards uh, burden of a crumbling society. Yeah, I mean, I think at that point, you know, we had been playing shows. We, you know, definitely made a lot of friends in other bands yeah. and um, got more confidence in what we were and what we were doing. And um, you know, we established the relationship with John, John Christoph, JC. Mm -hmm. um and he was recording um out of his parents basement in mayo pack yep. which is uh northern westchester almost over the border and um yeah we we showed up uh it was uh look i mean it was still very much a difficult recording process in the sense that uh you know we we're supposed to do it in what we did it in one day, right? Yeah. That's right. Wow. I mean, this is still we're young. Oh, it was tough. We didn't have we're any young, money. We're yeah, amped sure. up, and sure. we're like, yeah. you know, we're obnoxious to one another. Like, oh, you fucking do it, and all this stuff. And it's like, <laughs> you know, we did. We pull a fourteen-hour day, and we oh, do it in one God. day. We yep. had George uh, Torres from 
dehumanized with us, yep. who was, uh, you know, our good friend and my, you know, like my drum buddy that I, had, you know, we got close playing shows together and he ended up doing some, uh, some backup, vocals. backup vocals on that, especially joining us for some gang vocals. Well, and sure. I mean, you know, at the time it was still pre Pro Tools, right? So we were recording on actual reels. Oh, and yeah. and no, uh, he was using ADAT. ADAT. Oh, ADAT. Uh, oh okay. Like, you're right. Like you're right. Of, reels were later on. Yeah. 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 So there things. wasn't really yeah. much editing ab- available, right? So you needed to nail, like I needed to nail the no punching the drums. Well, no, yeah, the, the no punching was manual. Punching existed, yeah. Maybe it was, there was some, but it wasn't easy to do, it and it right. wasn't easy to like make it sound right. So... I'd have to record the drums from beginning to end. And, you know, any drummer who knows <laughs> that process, you know, you can you play an awesome song and then you get to the, you know, last bit and you fuck up a fill-in. And, wow. I mean. From the top. <laughs> it does a lot of things to you because you end up not playing what you really wanted to because you're, yeah. you're risking losing. So it's tricky. Um, and I'm, I guess for the guitars as well, right? Yeah, um, true. And so, but we, we did it and we were happy with it at the time. Sure. And I think that record gets a lot of, like, people love that record. Yeah, um, love that record. It's more of like an EP, but um, it was, uh, you know, we look back on it and we love it and everything. Like me personally, I love it, but yeah. it, you know, we were immature and not sure. quite, re- you know, we're not quite there yet, but we had a lot of great ideas um, Phil sounded really good on it. Um, the guys, after uh, the mental you know, Nando abuse, has sure. always been awesome with the leads and everything. It, um, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was awesome. I mean, the artwork for the CD was great. Who, who uh, did the artwork for the CD? A uh, guy uh, by the name of Mark Catalina. You may have who, heard his name in the Billy yeah. Club. Yeah, the Billy Club uh, World. Yeah, he was, you know, Glenn's boy. Yeah. Um, and a little help of Jay Ray too. Yeah. Jay Ray had a lot of like really cool, like Jay Ray came up with the original logo. Yeah, Jay Ray's an artist. an artist. Yeah. But so, I mean, we did the record and it felt good, but then when we got the artwork, I think it, it exceeded it became what real. was on the yeah. record yeah. Yeah. and it made, it kind of made it feel more official and sure. it was, um, uh, it felt good. I mean, the, the picture, uh, the band picture on there was it's kind of cool that we have uh, Phil's young son in there. Yeah. Um, we recreate that yeah. 20 years later. That was a picture yeah. we took right down the street here yeah. on... Um, Bainbridge. Mm, and on one night on something. Valentine, no? No, Bainbridge. Bainbridge. Yeah. Wow. Well, wasn't that for... Uh, it was towards like Kingsbridge, Meadow? Bainbridge. No, uh, New York Meadow, Meadow was up in We JC's Remember the farmhouse. apartment Nate and I had and, uh, the top of the with roof. the rooftop well, That's New York? That's the, the cover? No, no, no. no. no, no, that's, no that's Morris Mordor. Avenue. That's, that's Mordor. Mordor. New York Meadow's Mordor. Burden, you got access to your roof to go up there? No, Burden had, like, I had an attic apartment. Yeah, remember I that? remember that. Uh-huh. And you I could remember. step out until this outside area there, and that's where yeah. we took the photo. That's exactly oh, what I was. Why do I think wow. that that Years yeah, later, no, he know. went to my mother's building and took the New oh, York yeah. metal photo. Oh, you, okay. Then I wasn't there for that. Oh, yeah, okay. you, you yeah, that was just you know. It was just him. Pictures. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. But um, that's two albums later. Right. But Burden, <laughs> I feel like Burden finally legitimized us as a band. Sure. You know, because up until then it well, was just yeah. the, sh- yeah, the yeah, demo, the shitty demo, shit, yeah. terrible demo. Yeah. Um, which you know people still love, but I, I, I can, it's very tough. Listen to me. <laughs> I get it. You know, um, like when somebody yeah. asks me about like Candiria, I'm like, I love demo. surrealistic yes. madness demo. Yes. Wait, that's uh, surrealistic. Uh, sublim- uh, 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 subliminal, subliminal yeah. demo. And then I've yeah. even told the guys that, and they're just like, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. I'm like, no, dude, that shit is <laughs> fucking awesome. Yeah. Sure. But uh, I get it. You know, everything is something for everyone. Everything yeah. you know, our perspective on it is different because we were part of it right, but right, uh right. Yeah. but you know burden was awesome i mean it helped us it catapulted us yes. into the scene you know cemented uh our credibility uh a lot a lot um and um and it brought us closer together yeah yeah for sure you right? know when you have an experience like that and you can you see the finished product in your hands and you know you've worked your fucking ass off for that yeah with your best buds 
it's amazing. There's no words to that. It's, my it's parents hated beautiful. it. Yeah, <laughs> so did my mother. <laughs> yeah. No, no, what about what about your parents? His parents were the most supportive. Yeah, they they <laughs> loved the stuff yeah, that I was they doing. Were. Um, That's amazing. I mean, to tell you the truth, like when I first got into like metal, yeah, like my mom was like super worried. This was around the time with like you Same. know. Tipper Gore and the, yeah, the all the satanic, yeah, satanic, yeah, satanic yeah. and um, yeah. parental guidance. advisory, yeah. Yeah. advisory. And, and like yeah. I remember, um, like when I first started, like you know, buying like band patches and stuff like that, and she didn't like want me to like put them on my jacket. And I remember her one time going to my aunt and like asking her to look them over to see if there was any like you know devilry going on in there. My I remember my aunt going to she like this is double stuff. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Um, um, but, uh, you know, then my dad, you know, he, he told us that, look, you know, he has to, you know, be able to express himself and, and be able to, you know, uh, learn these things on his own and, 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 and discover like, you know, what he likes to do. He can't just like hold it back. Yeah. So after that, my mom kind of chilled out on that. But like, after that, like they loved the idea that, that I was like performing and, and doing, they would band. go to shows, they would go to shows. Uh, and they, they really loved it. That's really good. Cool. And I was really tight with his parents too, especially his dad um, back then. Yeah. Um, and I used to go smoke joints with him. Like when, even when Nana wasn't around, I'd just go hang out <laughs> with him and smoke joints. Um, and, and he's such a great musician. Yeah. Um, what a great influence he was on us. But yeah, very. They he had the most supportive parents. It's not that my mother didn't support it. She just didn't know that world. And, sure. and, you know, I had my grandmother telling her, that's devil worship. That's crazy. Yeah. Like, what, what is he doing? Uh, but eventually she just, I wasn't getting into trouble. And to, yep. to be honest, metal saved me from the streets. Yeah. Cause I could have easily gone that route and started selling drugs with my friends and sure. doing all that crazy shit. But instead I chose this, this, this Avenue to let out my frustrations or creative juices, whatever you want to call it. And it was the best gift I ever got. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so why don't you all talk about uh, touring and when you all started going outside of the New York City area um, and what that was like for you? So Kevin Scandato started managing us. He was the guy that ran Castle Heights. Okay, yeah. He and this guy, John the Doorman, who we love to this day. Uh, and he started connecting with, you know, guys in Albany and like towns like, you know, three hours up and whatnot. Yeah. And our first out of town thing was Albany, right? Wasn't it Albany? Was it Albany? Um, it was either the Albany or Brockton, Massachusetts? Or the Brockton One of them. I, I think Brockton was later. Is that Western Mass Brockton? Uh, uh, it's <laughs> east. It's, it's close to Boston. Oh, close to okay, Boston. Okay, okay. Uh, pretty rough so, area, actually. Um, we, I don't think we went that far. I mean, we probably played in, you know, we definitely connected with Albany a lot, right? Yeah. Because Teddy Tall up there yeah. would, you know, they trade shows. Uh, right. He yes. and uh, He'd bring Ted bands and, down here. Yeah. We'd bring bands up there. But Irate was the one out of Castle Heights that went there first. Uh, so we had... Um, and our first show was with like Section Eight, um, the the guy from uh, Brian from Shadows Fall, his first band. I forget uh, their name, but they um, Section Eight. Uh, it was an O name. I forget it though. But that was Brian's first band. They were on there, and the place was five hundred kids packed. Wow. And we were the first fucking band on, and it was. Yeah, well, Valentine's. It was packed, Valentine's, yeah. yeah. Valentine's. Valentine's, we play in, like, Saratoga Winters, yeah. um, which... I but Valentine's became our home away from home because we made an instant impact with that crowd. It was wow. a great venue, pretty sizable, especially for a, a local band coming up in the scene, right? Big space. You can fit at least 500, 600 kids in there. Yeah. And it was always packed. No matter who played there, the place was always packed. We played shows there with God Forbid, with Madball. So many bands um, over the years, and it was always packed. Wow. So that became our home, and we grew a really large fan base in that area. Uh, and then we, you know, we ventured over to like Smoky Tooth, okay. and not Smoky Tooth, but uh, the Eclipse yeah, uh, in Newburgh, and that's oh, where. Okay. No, that's Middletown. Bro. No, I think it's in Newburgh or Middletown, one of those two. Smoky but that's where Burn, All Out War and us used to play shows. Yeah. Or Billy Club and EGH used to come up sure, with us and play sure. shows. Sworn Enemy, we all would go up to there. 
and play shows with like had some local stuff too yeah. that wasn't as you know notor- not much notoriety but like we did the y- it's a couple of Yonkers spots sure. where Smoky we met Tooth. you know that's um, we did that with uh, is that Smoky Tooth we played uh, I remember I, I watched the Billy Club uh, interview they mentioned the Lowdown and Lowdown, Lowdown yeah so we played there right. now Mount it Vernon. was like a brand new development it's kind of sad it is. Um, yeah uh, the Bolt Show. That oh, was yeah. later though. That's that was like two thousand one. We played in um we played in Newark. What's that the pipeline? Oh the pipeline. pipeline. Oh. Yeah. You know, yeah. Long yeah. Island too, right? We yeah. we did definitely a lot of stuff on the island. Oh, no. um, yeah. yeah. Can't really remember exact But clubs. going farther, farther, Albany was that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. What about Pennsylvania? Did you all venture uh, Pennsylvania? Yeah, we Wilkes Bar, we Wilkes were Bar. out there. We went to Pennsylvania. Altoona at one point. Yeah. That's about as far west as we've pretty much ever gone i think we did philly once yeah yeah we played philly we played okay. philly it wasn't too great yeah um, PAA area we wasn't great for us up sure. More. Yeah. Sure. uh we've we've been as far down as uh ball uh well we went to virginia right or west virginia west virginia, west virginia. Uh, baltimore. Okay. baltimore we play sidebar tavern yeah. um that's probably a little later on i see that we, we were up uh doing that going around yeah. And the port the Puerto Rico trip is a little later on. That's two thousand four. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like so it was later. It's later. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, the burden stuff was ninety eight, and then um, we played a bunch. Yeah, ninety eight. Yeah, ninety eight, and then we played a bunch, um, which ultimately led to to the uh, the next record one, eleven thirty four. Eleven thirty four. That's two thousand one. Two thousand one, yeah. and that's when we started going abroad. I see. Yeah. I yeah. see. So two thousand. So yeah, eleven thirty four was really our first full record. Yeah. Um, there are some regurgitated songs sure. from <laughs> the the, the yeah, like we, that we, we done that we felt song, compelled to gone. Gone. Uh, yeah, we felt compelled yeah. to re-record just yeah. because. I mean, it, they, they sounded. They, they were exponentially sound. better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we got better at playing them, and we, you know, we always thought Burden wasn't a full, you know, it wasn't a full like, yeah, record. Sure. It was, it was like in between a demo and a, you know, an EP. Yeah. And so we we had some material that we we had on there, but you know, eleven thirty four was, um, uh, had a bit of a darker kind of vibe yep. to it. I mean, we spent a lot of time record, uh, you know playing and figuring out songs um there was a time in between then and and 11 34 you know where phil wasn't in the band and so me nick and nando spent a lot of time you know working on material and we um you could kind of hear it in, yeah. in that record uh definitely you know from from burden which had like more of an urban even the layout of the record to 11 34 yep. which was way more you know there's death and blood and um, and darker Very metal. sound, darker, is, yeah. just darker it material. Um, and then it happened to have coincided with 9-11. Uh-huh. So, I mean, literally the day we woke up, um, the day of 9-11, I woke up in, in, in Astoria, in Queens, where I lived at the time. And I was scheduled to go with Nick to master the record in New Jersey. And I woke up to phone calls from JC being like, turn your TV on yeah. and, you know, you know, the imaging, you know, the images of the towers, you know, which everyone knows were, were on TV. And yeah, I was like, I don't think we're quite going to Jersey today. Um, but uh, that's how I can always date that record wow. is, is you know, right during that time. Um but uh, going back to that record, you know, that was our first real effort at, you know, getting better at yeah. what we were doing at our craft. You know, we recorded the drums separately. We then later on layered, you know, we, we did some rhythm guitar at the same time of that session. That was done in Manhattan, actually. Yeah. And then, you know, post that, we, you know, Nando and Nick layered guitars and all the nuances of, you know, what this guy does and leads and then all the vocal stuff. That was like a real, like, it felt like a real almost pro level <laughs> effort. Yeah. Um, which we always wanted. We always uh, appreciated, like, bands 
the records that they were doing, not just the live, but right. you know the, the 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 artistry that is recording a record. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, that that's something that we we definitely got better at, and you can you know just in the three year period you can hear uh, a significant improvement. And there was a, a serious fire under our asses during that time because, like he mentioned, I'd left the band for a brief time. Yeah. I'm going to say about a year, uh, a little bit more than a year. I just had personal things going on. I was a new dad. I was I trying to figure it. that out. And working, band, uh, you know, fatherhood. Yeah. It was a lot for a 19, 20-year-old, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trying to figure it out. And I just was kind of lost for a bit, yeah. to be honest with you. And then, you know, we had things going. And I felt like I couldn't contribute on the level that I wanted to because of those other things. Um, so I was out of the band, but I, I never wanted to be out of the band. Sure. I never even quit. Sure. I just said, I can't do this for a while. And, and then Nick was like, well, fuck it. We're going to move on. Yeah. And, and he had every right to say so because, you know, the train don't stop. Right. Yep. So they continued. They had a, a brief run with this other guy. Uh, Joe Riley, Joe Riley. Joe. Um, and uh, you know that didn't work out for them, and they can get into that. I, I have nothing to say about it because I wasn't there. Yeah, sure. But um, you know, eventually we got back. Yeah. You know, uh, we had a conversation. We aired out a lot of grievances that they had with me at the time, and we got it straight. So going into that recording, I was, I was like, I'm gonna make this fucking legendary. They're gonna forget fucking Joe Riley, and, and 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 the real fucking vocalist of this band is back. So, um, so yeah, there was just a fire, and when we when that was done, I couldn't tell you how proud we were. Yeah, just to be back together, to not have any bullshit between us, and just to like, yo, let's just fucking play and do what we used to do at a higher level because we're better now. Uh huh. You know, and we just catapulted from there. Yeah, I mean, and then you know. The uh, the layout of the record too was yeah. something that you know we were proud of. We 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 got together with uh, this guy named Lior, uh, who's now called Lior Sefer, who's Lior quite a famous tattoo uh, artist. Yes. Tattoo artist made quite a name for himself. You know, we like I said, we, we were in the scene. We made a lot of friends who yeah. did all sorts of cool stuff, and so I don't think he really did record layouts before, but um, yeah, he was quite the artist. So he, he designed this whole crazy thing. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was just, it was wild because the like, when nine eleven happened, it's almost like, that's so weird because there's all this death and destruction in the yeah. city. And then we had this record that was already done. I mean, we didn't, sure. obviously didn't know. So it just kind of, um, you know, I, I don't want to say it felt right, but it just uh, it just kind of like felt like it um, uh, represented the times kind of well. Um, the yeah. one part about yeah. that record I'll say is, you know, Lior uh, being a fellow Israeli like me is, is <laughs> part mostly our fault. You know, a lot of spelling errors on that record. <laughs> oh, a lot God. of spelling and grammatical. <laughs> You know, I, I think we were too fucking high to, like, really sit and proofread <laughs> shit. Because it really is inexcusable. It's a lot of reading. It's a lot of um, reading. Yeah. A lot of really bad mistakes mm -hmm. on the record. Which, you know, maybe some folks never noticed. And now they're going to look <laughs> back and look at it. The guy I mean, so I'll, I'll shout myself out. So at that point of life, I wanted to call myself Phil the Guilty One Vibes. <laughs> So, one of the many because I was always guilty according to these guys, right? So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna fucking live up to that name, man. So when we look at it, it's Phil the Guyly one. <laughs> fucking T out. Left the, so I've gotten shit from Billy Club and everybody else for years. Wait, wait a second though. Over that crap. I didn't, it didn't even say vibes. It said vibs. 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 And it, Phil like, the Guyly one. I, I mean, vibs. I can check my phone, but I think till this day. You're in my phone as Phil Vibs. Like V I B Z. Yeah, now I do I do spell it V I B E Z. Sure, sure. But it's yeah, it was yeah. Vibs. It was Vibs. So I've been calling he you screwed Vibs me real since. bad. Yo, where's Vibs? Fucking the Orsifer. Yo, where's Vibs at? <laughs> I'm always calling you that. Um the, so that that part kind of sucked. Um and you know, we can sit here and blame him for it but the truth is it's our fault we should you know have been on no proofreading yeah. whatsoever yeah. i don't know if it's because 
you know, we just hyped to get we it just out. Wanted to get yeah. it out, and we were so focused on what's important to us, which is the music. Yeah. Um, and you know, we're not involved really with uh, artistic layouts of records. I mean, we approve stuff, but yeah, sure. It's not our central focus. So, uh, but it's funny though. It's part of our history, and definitely. we definitely made it up on on the next record. But the eleven thirty, you know, eleven thirty four, what two thousand one? We uh, that yielded uh, really cool stuff to have happen to us because we went to Japan. That's um, after that, right? As our record release, we record released the stuff there. Really? Yeah, this is Before so this anyone was, heard it out here. Was, yeah, was three months there. after or two months after nine eleven, we were it was October. not even like a it was month. October. And I remember because the flights, which we couldn't uh, come back, were really long. No, no one wanted to come to the U.S. Well, but going, you know, there was nobody on the plane. Yeah. So even though it was a 14-hour flight to Tokyo, you know, I remember stretching out nicely. and But it was still, you know, psycho-inducing amount of flying. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, we, we ended up uh, doing a pretty cool – that was our first time out of the country as a band. Amazing. And we played four yep. shows over Oops. eight days in yep. Japan. Uh, kind of, great. yeah, I mean, like, you know, it's cool. It's cool to show up and you have a room packed, uh, with people who are there to see you. I mean, this is stuff you can't buy. This no. is, this is only shit you earn and we earned it and, and it was kids, awesome. Kids that didn't know the language. Yeah. Who tried their best to sing along. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. I know. And it was around the time of 9-11 and just a really quick story. That day, I was stuck on the train in Fulton at 8.45 a.m. Yeah. I didn't know what the fuck was going on because I'm on the ground. Uh, the train stops and it gets stuck there for like an hour. And then all of a sudden, all this white powder comes in this day. I think I'm going to die. Yeah. Because I used to work in Wall Street at the time. Sure. And I'm like, okay, I'm never going to see my kid again. I'm going to die here. This is it. Uh, two hours later, they were able to get the power back enough to uh, get us out at Brooklyn Bridge. And then I go out and see... Fucking the apocalypse, basically. And, you know, army, police, everybody running. And I was just like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. And then I asked this police officer, what the, what is this? And like, I, I was scared as fuck. And he points in the direction of the towers. And I look, and I just see smoke. But I don't see the towers. Yeah. And I'm like, where the fuck are the towers? Yeah. And then he told me what happened. I, I just bugged out. But so it was a, a really crazy time in our country and all that. And when we went to Japan and couldn't come back until like a day or two later, because nobody wanted to come here. Yeah. But still and all, they were like consolidated. Yeah. And stuff. Still and all, we made that the best possible experience. It was something that I'll never forget. Those kids trying to sing along, uh, dancing hard, all, everything just like it made everything worth it. Yeah. That's yeah, cool. I mean, look, you know, you go to these, you go to Japan, and uh, you have a group of people who appreciate this uh, subculture, mm -hmm. you know, that is uh, New York based. But I mean, every city has their own <coughs> version of that. Sure. Um, and it's cool. You know, people ask me, "Look, what was it like?" And it's like, "Look, I mean, I Japan's cool, but it's like every place we went, we were immersed in this, you know, cocoon of." You know, whatever you know that 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 sub -genre, that subculture that we that they embraced. You know, yeah. they wear the Yankee hats, and they would they knew you know what, what we're about, and they, and they all had their own bands, and sure. um, they were doing their own thing too, and we were playing with them, and it was cool oh, yeah. because yeah. I mean, it was new for us to mm -hmm. be out yeah. this far. I mean, it's almost like I wish we went elsewhere first and then went to Japan because. Like, it was so many new things at once. Everything was new. Yeah. It was so new. But, but uh, one of the coolest things yeah. there was going to the local HMV, the record store there, mm -hmm. and pulling out a magazine and seeing an advertising for our tour. Uh huh. Oh, Billy that. Club has yeah, a similar yeah. story about when they went to Japan. And I, I was like, bugging out, man. Yeah. I, that, it wouldn't happen in the US. Next level. Yeah. yeah. No. No, seems. not at all. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. But yeah. that was a really proud moment. That's amazing. Um, just seeing that. Wow. I, I can't say enough good things about that trip. It was amazing. Uh, and not, Nando, um, do you have anything to add about uh, either 1134 or, or the trip to Japan, the tour in Japan? 
Um, I, I loved Japan. Um, got to try, I got to try shrooms for the first time. Yeah, we shroomed <laughs> out. For, <laughs> Legally. It was my birthday, Legally. and we shroomed yeah. out in kimonos yeah. in an old-style fucking Japanese hotel. That would hotel. be a great picture to show. <laughs> Uh, we do have those pictures somewhere, uh, but like, see. man, we I were tripping balls. our balls off there, and it was awesome <laughs> yeah. watching uh, Japanese variety shows. Wow. Yeah, the Japanese were very cool people. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I noticed that uh, they just like in general, they they love music. Yeah, and a lot of the the, the music out there is like really good and, and mm -hmm. very uh, influenced uh, by like Western sounds. Sure, uh, and. Um, they just like really good at what they do. Yeah. Um, culture is really cool. Respectful. Um, probably had like the the best Big Mac I ever had in my life was out there in McDonald's. <laughs> wow. I mean, uh, in Japan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah they like, do. The they like, do that. Western <laughs> fast food better than me. way <laughs> better. <laughs> way better. Um, um, some some weird stuff too. Like we did, you know, we we you know, we passed by some vending machines that had like you know that sold like used panties yep and, all that kind of stuff um and uh you, you, i guess <laughs> yeah. you, could, you could like drink beer like in a an open uh can of beer in a, in a car like in the driver's seat Not they had driver's vending seat, machines in the street for beer wow. right but vending machi uh, machines wow. in the street yeah. um a lot of interesting things that uh, we came across but uh the the, the people were so cool and so nice yeah i loved it um where else did you all tour as far as out of the mainland u.s we did uh, so, yeah, yeah, i mean a it wasn't times, it was sure. a year later yeah. that we went uh, it was thanksgiving 2002 where our you know uh first we european did our first run. european run which is still uh, off yeah. the back of 1134 sure sure um and uh it was our first tour it was uh yeah like i said it was november so it was a little, little chilly out um, we, our home base in Europe is always, uh, Brussels. Yeah. Um, all, you know, the, the three times we went, it was always like, we fly to Brussels, you know, this is where we, we gather our stuff. We, you know, meet some of our close friends who help book the tour, get the van going and all that. And then, um, so yeah, our first trip was, uh, uh, yeah, we played, that night that we got there in Belgium in like a Eberfest, I would like no, to say. No, no, that was the second trip. Second trip, okay. Um, um, we like a community center that was the first place. The hostel, we, yeah, the, the hostel. hostel, and we oh, were yeah. we stayed we there. Wow. <laughs> slept on the floor. I mean, none of these tours were luxurious. Sure, 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 no, sure, sure, it sure. was it was hard. It was when we got there. When we, when, we, when we got there. When we first got there. Like I remember, they they had set up some cots for us because like I we got it like five in the morning, we were a little, like jet lag or something. Yeah, we were playing that night, but we needed some sleep. Oh yeah, we're, we're sleeping, and there's just like people walking around us, and like you know, like going about their day. That was there was no weird. fucking sleep to be had. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, it had a bar there, so people were drinking yeah. while we were sleeping, and like, it was a thing, man. Uh, it was humble beginnings for sure. Over there. Sure. Uh, but the place was cool and the show was great. No, yeah. I mean, look, it was just like Japan. It was culture shock yeah. for all of us. I mean, I had been to Europe, you know, uh, on some trips here yeah. or there. Not a lot. Um, I think for these guys, maybe they didn't. I don't know if you guys had First been time. outside of, Never. you know, in yeah. Europe. So, you know, the band yeah. First time for them. had that cool aspect where, you know, we were experiencing things for the first time yeah. so um, speaking of experience yeah. one of the shows that now we brought our bass x blaze player at the time jay Wright with us yeah just to kind of help out and we also brought john christophe because we trusted him to do the merch for us while, sure. while we were there one day we played paris the show was phenomenal oh. it was awesome <laughs> right <laughs> and then afterwards we're riding that high and we go to like few towns away to go to this bar district okay now i'm a bronx guy so i know bad shit when I, I when i see it and i felt immediately when we got out of the car that we weren't in a cool spot yeah right so we go sit down eventually like i decide that i want to go to the store to buy a phone card to call home check on my young son of course right? yeah yeah and so i go with jay and again, Jay Jay is a dark skinned kid. Yeah. So we're walking. This uh, Moroccan guy comes up to us, 
and Kurt was also with us, our, our bass player then, uh, and, and okay. for the rest Nick's of the brother, time, sure. Nick's brother. Sure. So the three of us are walking. This guy approaches us and he's like, "Hey, you want to do drugs? You guys are American, right? You want to do drugs? I got this. I got that. I got that." And I'm like, "No, it's cool. We're just going to the store." But thank you. You know, I'm yeah. trying to be polite. So he keeps on following us and he keeps on insisting that we go do the drugs with him. And we're saying no politely. We get to the store. He calls my friend Jay the N word and sucker punches him. Oh wow! Okay. So we well, he's also like. He's also like, well, you're American and you're in Paris yeah, now, yeah. and how come you think I'm you're speaking, this and that? I'm speaking yeah. English and you're here and you don't speak French. Yeah, you don't respect my country. Like he he started yeah, saying all, all kinds of yep. <laughs> bad stuff, and I'm like, dude, this is not going to end well. It's just not gonna end. <clears> so, <throat> and then he lip. hits he hits my friend, and me and my friend kick his ass. Yeah, but guess what? It's a setup because he's got more guys. So he yells in the street, and they start coming down. No, but, so. But, um, okay. So we turn around and book it back to the bar. Yeah. Which we were like hanging, hanging out, drinking. 40 deep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> with all, with all the bands the that played the show. Yeah. And I remember, right? We're hanging out. There's like some, you know, Heineken beer bottles on the table. Yeah. yeah. J. Ray comes bursting. And he's like, no, we don't fucking beef. <laughs> he takes one of the, the bottles. Yes. And then he goes to smash it on the table. Bing. It doesn't break. <laughs> So we get up, we go outside. I'm like, oh, but what are, what are we going to experience? I go outside, and immediately, I, I think Phil points a guy out. He's like, that's the dude. And the guy sees me, and he throws a punch at me. Oh, 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 oh. And I grabbed his, his, yeah. his, his wrist. Yeah. And I was like, yo, chill out, dude. And then he, he, he tries to hit me with the other one. And I grabbed that. I'm like, yo, what's going on, dude? And, and then I, I just tripped him, and then I landed on top of him. And I was yeah. just trying to, like, like relax. And other guys come down, and then there's then, a whole yeah, thing between wow. our, our crew and their crew. Mm. And then the cops mm -hmm. get called. They immediately show up, but who do they put on the wall? Us. Because uh -huh. we're the foreigners. Yep. So well, if it wasn't for the bands that we played with saying, no, they're not the bad guy here, uh, we would have gotten arrested. And Jay still had to go to the precinct and file a report. Right. Yeah. So well, we were scared they wouldn't let him go. Well, I think they took him because he was the dark one. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. probably. I think that's what that was about. It's so it was just funny, funny because, <laughs> but it was hilarious. The look on their face when they realized they fucked with the wrong ones. Yeah, sure. yeah. because the whole <laughs> bar emptied out, and these guys they think they you know they're messing with a couple American tourists who are here alone. They got a rude awakening. The whole bar came out. They were like, yeah. <laughs> so I see him. So when Nando yeah, grabs the dude, UV because it gets yeah, his in. <laughs> And they it was know, just a thing, they man. They, they know what the fuck happened. Yeah. So uh, we got the victory on there, but it was a long... And then we were staying in a hotel that had two big Nigerian bodyguards with two Rockweilers on each hand and shit. It was... We're hookers and pimps. Yeah, it was really sleazy. Wow. It was really sleazy. Wow. We couldn't sleep that night because yeah. we thought somebody would break into the room. It yeah, was one sure. of those places. Paris so, is... Paris it's Paris it's fucking slow. grimy yeah. as fuck where we were. Yeah. And that was a night that I will never forget. Wow. Oh, I'll tell a funny story. Um, the first that was, that was our first tour, huh? Yeah, in it was Europe. Wow. So when we're uh, we're going through Europe, you know, we're, we land in Belgium. We play, you know, Belgium. We played, um, you know, the neighboring countries, Holland. Uh, maybe we we go in the well. Germany was last on that tour. I remember that. But we're in Paris, and you know, the next day we're. Um, we're going to take the ferry to England. Yeah. And uh, I had never been there. And I, you know, so that was exciting. But I was also like, this is cool. Like, you know, I mean, look, everyone's cool in all these places we've been. But it's like, you know, they have heavy accents. And they don't all speak English very well. Um, so it's like, oh, finally, we're going to go somewhere where, you know, we're going to be able to communicate a little better. And we, we, we get to, into the city. Uh, we get to... We get to uh, we, we, you know, we take the ferry over from France, uh, we drive up, we, we go into London, we're playing that night in, um, the uh, London Underworld, which is a pretty, like, it's like their CBGBs. Yeah. And like, we, bigger, like, though. we're in the back, and then, uh, in comes, like, the, these guys, like, the whole crew, the LBU crew, you guys, yeah. and, like, just... So, and, Knuckle Dust, and, and all their peeps, and like Cartel and Bother. They're introducing themselves and all that. And I can't understand <laughs> a fucking word they're saying. The whole time I'm like, 
Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, what? <laughs> what? And then, like, I mean, the hat, the accents were so thick. We're talking like, you know, freaking New York, uh, hard, you know, hard New York, London hardcore dudes. You know, <laughs> with their own slang. With their own slang. Yeah. yeah sure. This yeah. isn't even yeah, like this big, isn't proper British here. Yep. 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 And yep. I didn't. I'm mean, <laughs> such a fucking idiot. I didn't even. Expect that. Like, what did I expect? Like tea time. You know? Like these fucking guys come in. I couldn't understand a fucking word they were saying. I'm like, yeah. I was so thrown off. I mean, the slang is thick. Yeah. Remember, Eventually, we caught on a little bit better. But that first night, I was like, what the they, fuck? They kept throwing this word around, bird, this bird, this bird, this bird, that. And after a while, I was like, what is a bird? I hear you guys keep saying, it. Like, oh, it's a female. I was like, Oh, like chick. Okay. Yeah, and like eat my AIDS and sayings like that. Uh, eat my AIDS. Do you remember that? Yeah. It's like what the cheers. Fuck? They were saying cheers, cheers, cheers. for everything. Well, and, um, I'm used to hearing cheers. I mean, I get that, but it's so different it than like what we're used to. So, but the greatest dudes, yeah. awesome dudes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. I, I consider Great those show. and those guys yeah, family to this shows, day. Man. And the shows were phenomenal. The English could get down yep. and be violent. And do everything that we're used to seeing here. Absolutely. Uh, uh, on an insane level also. So, so but before we continue to move forward with the band's history, I just want to take it back a little bit sure. and ask you all about the BDC. Okay. Because I think, I, think I think it kind of dissolved by this point as far as... Yeah, I was way gone. Thing, but, yeah. Well, let's uh, hear about so, the BDC, BDC so. was just bands, you know? And it was uh, Go to Mentis. It was Driven by Hatred. Rights Reserved, yep. Blackout, Irate, uh, Billy Club. Um, did I say Go to Mentis? Yeah. Go to Mentis. Uh, and uh, a lot of other bands. Uh, yeah. Proof of Purchase. If, Proof of purchase. Trying to remember all these bands. Um, oh, look, I, mean, I think there's a tendency for people who are local um, to want to, you know, you know yeah, tribe it up. Yeah, because, you know, they see the other people doing that yeah, right you yeah, know you so got brooklyn so and the brooklyn chamber. is so yep. thick with yeah. talent and bands yep. in the bronx you know not as much you yeah. know let's be real at least in this genre yeah sure and so you know and that goes anywhere you know you get a bunch of dudes who are in separate crews but you come together and you want to oh let's call you know let's be this let's do that and i mean it wasn't like there wasn't an organization to no. it yeah. um yeah. it really was just bands yeah just Trying to tribe it up and, and make a force mm -hmm. coming out of the Bronx. Yeah, I mean, you're better, you know, in that setup than on your own, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. Because you can then book a show together or, you know, it's uh, power in numbers or whatever the know. term is, yeah. And then, Strength you know, and, and Bronx Unity was born for Bronx Unity was yeah. that. That was, that, that was, the, yeah. Written by Nick, of course. Most yeah. famous, uh, Oh, yeah. BBC Written by Nick is not from the Bronx. Yeah. 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 The only guy not from the Bronx. Um, That's so funny. But I mean, he's 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 got his clout here. He's got his clout here. Definitely. Oh, yeah. He oh. came here enough and was part of this yep. just like us. Yep. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so that was kind of what that was. Just sure. like a coming together of, of like-minded people who played similar styles of music. Everyone had their own flavor. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know? I mean. And then, you know, certain bands kind of came out of it on a, on a more regional, you know, regional and global level, right? But, like, to the core, it was just great people, great music, um, and, and, you know, not too many egos, you know. Everybody was pretty chill. I mean, there's always a set of competition. It's competition. You know, Don't get it bands. wrong. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, um, but, I mean, it was well, Billy. So Billy Club wasn't really part of the BDC, but I mean, they were Martin was, fellow so. Bronx. Yeah, yeah. Martin Gordon and Gary. Has, so yeah, yeah. So they count. Uh, uh, Billy Club has always been like our brother band. Yeah. You know, we shared a rehearsal space. So once, once we left, uh, you know, the dad's house in Riverdale, we we had a stint in Far Rock of the way. city, um, and then. Uh, we moved into our rehearsal spot, which was uh, which was which was our spot for many years in Mount Vernon with, with Billy Club. Ah, um, so, but so Billy Club was always kind of like, you know, our 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 guys. Um, and then EGH and Sworn Enemy. Yeah, yeah and then you know that whole Castle Heights yeah. thing became the, the Five Fingers of yeah, yeah. Five uh, Fingers of Death. Five Fingers of Death. 
uh, and a band from upstate called Eye to Eye. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah this yeah, is yeah. just from us right. tour. You know, playing locally yeah. together. I mean, we 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 went. Did we play? Uh, we played in Europe with EGH. Yeah, we did. Uh, we didn't go anywhere with Billy Club besides Puerto Rico. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that's that. Um, Those are our brother bands. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, for the most part, we've stuck together. Like, you know. Uh, EJ's sworn, you know, I, whenever I see Sal and them, I, I'm always happy. Yeah. You know, Rob and, and 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 that crew, always happy. And then us, and, I, and I, that's all we, we have each other, you know, and, I, and that's a beautiful thing that 30 years later, we can still hang and enjoy life and, you know, have some beers together and talk about the old days and things like that. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, so do you all want to get into New York metal now? Yeah, sure, we could sure. do that. Yeah. New York metal. New York metal. Um, so, process. When did we start writing songs for this? Well, I mean, we always wrote songs. Uh, we had well, some in the back. Burner, I yeah. mean, uh, Nando and Nick wrote songs on their own. Um, it's always kind of in the style, right? Each one sort of brought an entire song, or <laughs> mostly an entire song. Um, I mean, that became um, more of the way we did things later on. Yeah. We, um, it's not that we didn't do songs together also, um, but most of the time it was like, okay, well, Nando has this song and Nick has that song. So we rehearsed these songs at practice. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it came time to record. I guess this was like 2004, I'm going to say. Yeah. Because we put that out in 05. Um, I guess for me, the diff, the thing that I wanted to do this time in terms of like production was, uh, let's not go to Manhattan to a fancy studio. Let's not, let's just all do it with JC. I mean, JC was with us at the studio in Manhattan, but let's just do it at JC's place, okay. which at the time was a new uh, a studio that he um, he moved out of the basement. Yeah, yeah he's, he's no longer in the parents' basement. He has a property now a little further north. He built his house. Yeah, in Patterson, wow. New York. Wow. Yeah. yeah, but the recording wasn't done at the new studio. The recording was done in the old structure, right of the house, right of the house. Right, 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 right. So I did the drums, you know. Uh, there upstairs in this like old farmhouse that he had purchased. I mean, it goes back um, history there even prior to the independence of this country. Wow! I believe okay, George okay. Washington even had stayed in that vicinity or in that house. So it was kind of cool. Um, and um, it was cold out, and yeah, so it was it was, it was dark and cold, and I ended up doing uh, drums for that. Um, over the course, Twice. yeah, I'll get into that. Um, I ended up doing drums. I think, I think it was, so this time around, I, the focus was also like, you know, I mean, 1134 wasn't a one day recording for drums, at least, and then all the other stuff. Uh, I think we spent two, two days or three days, three yeah. sessions. So it was going to be the same thing with this. Um, we stayed locally at a hotel just over the border in Connecticut, the Hanbury area. And, yeah, we were just going to track drums, get that all done. I mean, by then we had Pro Tools fully set, so we were able to uh, punch in and do that sort of thing. And even post-production, we could do uh, some editing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think this day and age, people do that a lot. Yeah, and sure. It, you could hear it. Um, I mean, we weren't overusing it, but we were using it. It was helping, it was helping me be able to relax and play what I want to play because I know I'm not going to fuck up the entire track because at the end of the song, I want to try to pull off some stupid drum fill or whatever. <laughs> um, so we ended up doing that and uh, I finished the drums. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but a couple of weeks later, we, I get a, you know, JC tells us that he, <laughs> that the drums are gone. <laughs> They're gone. Like it's gone. deleted. Yeah. It's gone. It's not in the hard drive. So I ended up doing drums on that record twice, which was good and maybe bad because I, I think I did some stuff better. Yeah. And then I remember I, 
um, had I couldn't recreate what I had done. I remember I had no reference because I couldn't even hear it. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, that's what it was going to be, right? Um, <laughs> and so we recorded that that way, and then you know, Nando and Nick. Um, uh, I think what was different about that record was Nick's songs. Nick recorded all the rhythm for that song. So when you hear the guitar on either side, you'll hear just Nick. You know, Nando will come in and do, you know, um, uh, so harmonies and, and solos. But if it's a Nick song, you're, you're hearing Nick only. Yes. And if it's a Nando song, you'll hear Nando only. I see. Um, and so that was a bit different for us. And cool. I like that. Um, you know. And then, yeah, I mean, after that, pretty standard stuff. Phil comes in and uh, lays down at the, you know, at the very detailed direction of Nick. Nick yeah. was always, you know, very up on, you know. Coach Nick. Lyrics on vocals, on what Phil is doing. Because, I mean, a lot of these songs, not a lot, but, you know, more than half are like Nick's babies. And then Nando's ha has his sort of thing. And then I just come in and help with um arrangement ideas stuff like that and and obviously the drums um but I, I i tend to have a lot of opinions about guitar solos and like all the stuff that happens that gives the songs like color and shit like that yeah but um yeah, i mean that's my take on it i mean the record was yeah. was mature and it's it's my favorite record um, it's the one I, I mean, I don't listen to, I rate very much, sure. but if I do, I listen to that one, um, uh, because it's the most mature record and it's the most representative of what I always thought we would sound like. And, you know, personally as the, as a drummer, what I, you know, wanted to play or, yeah. and how to play it, you know, it wasn't just like, you know, it's just, I feel like what I wanted came out. Instead of like some of the previous records, what I wanted and what came out were different, and that's limitations due to skill, sure. experience, uh, recording settings, stuff like that. Um, but that's part of the learning process, and I think New York Metal captured that um, pretty well. Uh, yeah, I mean that's my take. What's up, you guys? Um, well, you know, uh, I uh, we decided to do like a like a quad guitars whereas like the the um, previous albums would just be like one left one right sure but uh you know with all the stuff that we listened to growing up like metallicas and whatever a lot of those guys you know they you know uh use you know four guitars that's right yeah. so the, one of the uh the call the reason where each guitarist did his own song was so that like when he's uh, layering on top of his own stuff, it's easier to layer to your own stuff oh, rather I than see. than try to play to somebody else's stuff. Yeah. So this way, it could be much tighter. Um, and I was very happy with uh, the thickness of the sound. It was definitely you know, like that, that kind of sound I was looking yeah. for. So you know, everything's like super heavy. Yeah. Uh, and the drum sounded like really good. Um, I remember we. Um, Drums were recorded in that that place, but the, the, the guitars, like uh, and the vocals, we went up to to um, uh, JC's um, parents' place where, where we recorded everything else, and ah, then the, I see. all the guitars there. Familiar ah, ground for us. Familiar ground, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because what happened was after we did the drums, he tore that house. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like literally the drumming in there was the last, whatever oh. anything that's ever happened in that house. Um, so that's kind of cool. I never really that is thought cool. of that. Um, yeah, because what he has now in that same footing is his new home with a new studio, beautiful stuff. Yeah. Um, and even the, you know, the rec, the, the pictures we have on the record, which are kind of gloomy and dark and they're not so clear Blurry. But on purpose, on purpose, you know, yeah. um, it was done in the neighboring farmhouse that was like half you know the winter pictures okay. yeah okay. Mm -hmm. they were done in that there was like a farmhouse next door that was like missing a roof and stuff and it was like it was really cold out it's up there and scary northern, wow. like southern winter scene what's the next wow. county after west sure. there's orange there's putnam uh, putnam i think putnam, yeah um so i guess it just we can try to capture what we were dealing with which was yeah really cold environment but um 
Um, one thing on that record that stands out um, was the song Vendetta. I mean, you know, <laughs> can't deny that one. You know, that song was uh, uh, one of Nick's babies. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he, he, you know, the approach of it was different for me as a drummer. Um, and it was because it felt different. It yeah. felt more like a hardcore song. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and it was because of the lyrical content, right? This was sure. a really pissed off song because we, I mean, we kind of skipped over it, but we had the whole, the whole name copyright issue. name issue that we had. With, with um, a band from California. With the irate from California. Um, and this was our diss song to that. <laughs> And uh, we, <laughs> we, we fucking buried them with that shit. Yeah. Destroyed them. They, they never tried to. They, they to did, but it. it was so weak. Yeah. It, was weak it was new metal week, and just like <laughs> Look, this on, was guys. the new. This was the new Biggie versus uh, <laughs> <Top> Tupac. <laughs> West and East you decimated Coast. Them. We decimated uh, they, them, bro. They, they, embarrassingly they so. Responded. But um, you know, w w I just you know I didn't want it. I wanted to play something where. You know, it was just going to be like, boom, boom, boom. Every fucking p part is like heavier, heavier. And um, and Nick, you know, it was a simple song for us, right? We, yeah. we didn't know, Nano didn't do any harmonies or guitar solos. Yeah. It was just straight up like just uh, heavy. Yeah. And, we took um, it back to the Bronx. Took it back yeah. to the Bronx. That's you know, it. That's the never, I can describe yeah. that. I mean, we never, yeah, wanted, we never, you know, didn't. We always had it in us, and yeah. Uh, yeah. even to this day, I would imagine that we're all still as you know, pissed off as well. These guys are doing all sorts of tech death stuff, so they're all <laughs> fucking crazy. But um, yeah, you know. Um, so yeah, that was a song that really um, it, it got a lot of notoriety. You know, I mean, it was it was probably the least effort. Out of all the songs, yeah, yeah, but, um, and the most impact though at the yeah. same time, yeah. Um, you know, obviously having uh, uh, Malone from Billy Club do the intro was pretty epic, yep, to say the least. Yeah. Um, and that's a large part of it, but the song also brought it, you yeah. know, <laughs> and um, yeah, it was like yeah, you know, I was surprised to see like the kind of impact that it had. Yeah, I, I didn't think it was gonna like. Like load, like yeah, we didn't write it for that. We wrote it because yeah. we were pissed and we were going to tell these guys <laughs> to fuck off. And we did. Yeah. And then years later, we got all these people covering it. Lots of covers. So I was just going to say that. Uh, I have a folder. Yeah. I have a couple folders. One is a YouTube folder. One is uh, social media like Facebook. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, over 100 bands globally that have covered either that song or Jesus. Transcendence. Yeah. Like It's all in this folder. It's crazy. Wow. I sometimes go through it and watch them again, but... It's so humbling that yeah. that song has such an insane impact. Like my friends, Inferior Five are about to cover it. Wow! Like because I did a collaboration with them recently, and they're gonna uh, they're gonna have a record release party and all that. And they're yeah. like, "Hey, you know, we we want to cover it. Right? What do you feel about that?" And I was like, "Awesome!" <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, we to get, get that recognition, uh, millions of hits on yeah, YouTube. Millions. I mean, it's not even from our YouTube channel. I mean, I don't no. think we have a YouTube channel. We're, people we're, posting it. Yeah, there sure. was no YouTube when we broke no. up. Yeah. Um, but there's people who post like the video that was sort of put together for the song it wasn't like an official video, right, but it, right. was, it was for like a guerrilla warfare DVD of sorts. And somebody put together all this footage and threw the track on there, and that that track's actually our, the demo version of that track. It is. Um, ah, it is. Yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah. which seems to be more popular than the original because it's roar. Then not yeah. the original, then the uh, the, the, the uh, New York metal version. But um, um, millions of hits and all this stuff covers from all over the world. Not a fucking dollar. For it. <laughs> <Of course>. <laughs> <laughs> not one penny. <laughs> God damn it. I mean, nothing. <laughs> And that's fine, you know, um, because uh, we never did it for the money. Yeah, yeah. You know, we did it because it's our passion. And uh, that's what it is, man. Passion doesn't pay. No. <laughs> I, think so, I, I think I remember Malone in the Billy Club oral history talking about, I, it, I, I think it was Vendetta, hearing it in South America. I, for, I, forget, yeah. I forget what country, but yeah, hearing a band in South America cover it even. It's where they saw that, and then while they were in Japan, 
playing a show, someone, one of the bands covered Bronx Unity. And, <laughs> and they flipped their shit. They were like, what the fuck? Um, so, and, and that was a cool to hear that, yeah, too. Yeah. Um, from my perspective, um, when we did New York Metal, we were a well-oiled machine yep. at that point. We were tired as fuck. Uh, I had found what I wanted to do vocally and mastered it at that point. Yeah. And these guys were off the fucking rails with what they were doing musically. So you combine all that. Now, when we did Vendetta, I remember Nick is my coach. Yeah. And, the, and I rate Nick as my coach. And, and the new band, he's my coach. But uh, um, he he always found the right words to amp me the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and he would pull me to the side. And he, he gave me that history. He's like, look what these motherfuckers did. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Like, you, you're you not going to let them fucking get away with that shit, are you? Who the fuck are you, motherfucker? And then and it just, just like got me so hype. I was ready to fucking kill. Uh, so, uh, but but Nick is, in my eyes, the captain of the team. Yeah. Um, always and forever. The level of respect uh, that we have for him is astronomical. And... Um, he was always great in the studio with me and I owe my entire career to him uh, vocally. Yeah. You know, that, that constant, this is not good enough. You got to top that. You know what I'm saying? And, and what we did, him and I really did well is get my enunciation yep. really well uh, so that it's as clear as can be in extreme music, right? Sure. So when I hear back the material, like I'm proud of it, man, because it was like, you can understand what I'm saying. You know, but that took a lot of work to get there. Yeah. Death metal vocalists are not the most clear, mm -hmm. you know, but we, and, and that's a practice that I have to this day. I will not uh, finish, I, I, I won't finish a song until it's fucking, I, and in my mind I can hear it. Yeah. Every fucking syllable. So that's what he instilled in me, and that's, I owe him my old vocal existence. Uh, and he's the best, and shout out to Nick. And, uh, you know, we, but we were really tight yeah. at that point. So we were excited to get in there and bring that next level of irate out. Yeah. Some of our, you know, some people consider 1134 to be our pinnacle, but I consider that sure. to be the pinnacle. Uh, because musically, you, you you couldn't fuck with us back then yeah. you know, at, at that point. So I'm really proud of all the material, but... That was if that was gonna be the last one for us. Yeah. That was the perfect fucking record to end on. Yeah, and um, real proud of it. I listen to it to this day, whenever you know I want to go down memory lane. Yeah, and um, it's great to listen to in the gym. In the gym, yeah, yes, it pumps you up. Yes. <laughs> and so recently, with teaming up with Cold Cuts Merch and having them do our merch, uh, we decided to print those uh, albums again on vinyl. So, you know, we had to go back. I had to rewrite lyrics and, and all that stuff. Yeah. And so there was a lot of listening to the material. And it turns out there was a shitload of mistakes there, too. <laughs> there was a shitload of mistakes there, too. Uh, so hopefully don't, don't this time yeah. around. Uh, so, so far from Cold Cuts, we've released um, New York Metal. Yeah. And we're going backwards. The next one will be 1134, I and then see. we'll do um, Burden Last. I see. Uh, but all the material is in their hands now, and they yeah. just got to mock it up and, and do it. But we're proud that all these years later, people want that they shit. Do. Yep. Uh, and it it does well. Like, yeah. I for a band that's been broken up 18 years, the fact that we're constantly in the, the mouth of youth – of old school people, of uh, bands like Fury of Five who are covering covering us years later, like it's so humbling, man. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, and I couldn't love these guys any more, man, because they're, they're my heart and soul. Yeah, they're my heart and soul, and and I'm glad that we're still hang out together. We're in each other's lives. My son worked for him. Oh wow! You know they have their own relation. They they he has his own relationship with them. Um, it's it's beautiful, bro. Yeah. I rate is beautiful in so many different ways besides the music. Sure. You know, and that's just kind of what I want to say about that. But Nick was, he's the maestro, you know, or it all goes through him. He's our quarterback. You know, I deliver his message and lyrically him, me and Nando wrote. I see. I, was gonna I wasn't so much of an egomaniac that I needed to write everything. Yeah, sure. He had visions with his song 
And sometimes he would write them lyrically. He's like, this is what I wanted to be about. Yeah. But he always wrote it with my voice in mind. Nice. That was his thing. He had my voice in his head. And he would, uh, and you know, write cool shit, man. And I never had to say, no, I don't want this or I don't want that. It was fucking perfect every time. Wow. Nick, Nick always had a knack for songwriting. Yes. I mean, when I first wow. uh, met the, them and got to play with them, one of the things that I noticed was that their songs like popping. Yeah. And like, uh, it definitely got me to like want to play with them and, and be in the band. And, uh, you know, he's always wrote like really mm -hmm. like interesting songs that had hooks. Like, like the guy know, like knows what he's doing as far as like like writing music, hooks, and, and brutal, all of it <laughs> in one sandwich. Yeah, and that's the beauty of Nick Irate. Wow, you know, and you know, I'm sure in the later years of the band, him getting the opportunity to play with his brother must have been awesome for him. Yeah, yeah, and and for Curtis. Yeah, sure. You know, just to have them, you know, vibe off each other on 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 the stage and everything, and creating and all that and recording. I thought that was a beautiful thing too. Yeah. Uh, and Curtis is a great part of our history, and I don't want to leave today without saying that because sure. what a great, phenomenal bass player he was, finger bass player. You know, he was classically trained on guitar, so this oh, was wow. bass was like not came easy to him to just do all the stuff, and you know, yeah, he was awesome. So the two brothers, the Reese brothers, fucking legendary. Yeah. Do you want to talk about, um, you know, the decision to, I guess, dissolve irate and what all was going on? Sure. You, you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> it's all my fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so during the, you know, during our, uh, our, our, our run, if yeah. you will, um, I think that we, you know, we underachieved in our eyes. Yeah. Okay. You know, between us personally, when we talk and stuff, um, even though we did cool stuff and we appreciate everything and everyone and all that, um, we, I, you know, we had on, maybe we had unrealistic expectations, um, for what we, we wanted to be, what we thought we could be. Um, and so, you know, playing shows isn't easy. Uh, being in a band with four other guys uh, isn't easy. It's like being married to each individual yep. person. And, uh, you know, with other things in our lives, um, it makes it challenging. It's not impossible, but it makes it challenging. And, um, you know, you, you play shows and what people see is the 30, 40 minutes you're on stage. And that's the part that's the best, right? For us and for everyone. But what you don't see is, you know, how it starts. Yeah. It starts by going and waking up in the morning, going to the studio, getting your, you know, when you're at our level, right? I mean, I, I was the guy who drove most night, well, all the time and had the van and all that. And so, um, logistical stuff was always my, you know, my thing. So like, you know, you go, you get your equipment, you load up, you know, guys need to be picked up or not, or they come, I don't know. And you drive and you show up and they want you there a certain time. And then you're, you're waiting around. And, you know, this is how a lot of musicians and people in the entertainment industry develop bad habits, right? Yeah, Cause sure. you're bored most of the time you're waiting to perform. Um, so you wait, you perform and then you, you got to unload, you got to, you know, schmooze and all that, right? <laughs> uh, and then you go you drive back and then you unload and then everyone needs to go home. And next thing you know, it's been a 16 hour day. Yeah. And you've oh got no money to show for it. Uh huh. Um, and that's fine, right? Because, like I said, excuse me, we're not doing this for money, but it's costing money, which sucks. And um, so you do that. We did that for years, years and years. And, and, and that's great. If you show up to the show and there's, you know, a, a lot of people there or, or it doesn't have to be a lot, but it could be just a few and they're really into you and that's yeah. cool. I mean, we're not, uh, but it's better when it's a, a packed house. Yep. And as time went on, uh, those packed houses became less and fewer in between, uh, you know? 
few and far between. So I think it took a toll. It took a toll on me. Um, I think also like the dynamic with the guys. I mean, it was an always awesome, you know, like I said, it's a marriage. And so it became stressful. Uh, I mean, I, I speak for myself in this. Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, and so it became frustrating. And uh, ultimately for me, it was like, you know, I think we're, I don't think we're going to really progress anymore from here. I think we're just going to continue on this plateau where, um, where it's, you know, musically it's fulfilling, but we're not really catching any, you know, not that, I, not that a break is really what I'm trying to say, because I feel like when you get a record deal and all that, that's really just the, the beginning of the real hard work. I mean, yeah. it's not like, it's not like this, you know, at a point where all of a sudden, oh, we made it. I mean, it's not nothing, nothing's like that in any career and anything you do. Um, but we were, we didn't even get to that point. I mean, we did, but that's another, um, and, um, I don't think we were going to get there again. Yeah. And, and I think it, there was a degradation of, you know, how I felt about doing it. And I just wanted to stop. Now I wanted to maybe like continue on musically at yeah. least, but not commit to shows and all that. I don't think the rest of the guys were into that. And I think the band died at that moment. Yeah. And, you know, one thing I'll say is, you know, we haven't played a show since. We haven't done anything since. Yeah, we've done the T-shirts and putting out vinyls recently. And, sure. And, I mean, I think that's fine. You know, there's people who, who die, literally, and you still can buy their T-shirt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you still buy a Jimi yeah. Hendrix shirt. That's right. You know, and hopefully his estate or whoever... Um, or whoever, whatever company owns the rights to them, get the money. But, um, you know, um, we, I was pretty, I was always pretty militant about like no reunions, no this, no that, like we're fucking dead. Yeah. And then when you die, you are not there anymore. Yeah. Um, and the one thing that lives on forever is the music. Uh, and that's the beauty of this. I mean, we can all pass away and you still have the record. That's right. And that's what we fucking did it for. Yeah. You know, the shows are great, but the records outlive the artists. And that's what makes it feel good because I'm like, well, we did we did that. I mean, and and that's what's left and hey, enjoy that. Like we're not dissing you. Yeah. <laughs> but um that's that's my take on it. I'm not saying that's everyone's take. That's my take. Um but that's how the band died. Music, music is waves. You're gonna have high points. You're gonna have low points. At the time that I rate broke up, it was a low point. Yeah. And just that's just scene shit. It wasn't I rate specific. Like people didn't all of a sudden say I don't like that fucking band no more. Yeah, sure. It was like people grew up, went to college, got families. Yep. So you know you have to kind of like ride the waves to find new armies to like get into your stuff and all that. So I think we were riding a low period. It was frustrating. We were not having issues with each other, but it's like he said, you go through shit. Yep. So there were days that he and I were pissed at each other or somebody else was pissed at somebody else. Like it happens. You can't be in a band and not have that happen. Yeah. Okay. Anybody that says that is full of shit yes. or has been together three weeks, <laughs> you know? So yeah, like a lot of factors went into that decision. And some of us were ready to move on, and some of us weren't, but had to eat it. Yep. And so that's what happened. Um, but I feel like we then exploded again. Yeah. Um, as far as popularity, and now, 18 years later, we're fucking popular. Yep. We're like one of those bands that everybody wants to see again or for the first time. Yeah. New generations, whatever it is, they're interested in us again, which is why we can afford to make the shirts and do the vinyls and all because we know it's going to sell. Yeah, right? sure. But, um, and it's also our way to, yeah, we're not a band anymore, but thank you. Yeah. You know, we're, we love you and we appreciate what you are to us. And so if you want to rock this gear, rock it happily. You know what I'm saying? And, and, 
that's kind of where we are. But it also kind of not rebuild our relationships, but brought us closer together where we were kind of like our own thing back then. Everybody was just after the show, everybody went their own separate ways. Sure. Um, so I, I love that. Yeah. I love that we've been able to stay in each other's lives. We rolled the lows and came out of it better on the other side. Yeah. You know, uh, I was crazy when I was young. I'm a fucking asshole. I admit that. But I also grew from that and learned a lot of valuable, hard lessons. Yeah. You know, and that's why we can all be in the same room now and awesome and everybody's all love. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. we're not on that shit anymore. Yeah, sure. But that's kind of what was going on. Plus the the irate versus irate thing took its toll. I know, mean, yeah. Most definitely took its toll. For everybody to have to answer questions about it, talk about it. Threaten each other about it because you know, I'm not gonna lie. I told those guys, You ever come to New York? I'm fucking you up. Well, I mean, look, it was, it was fraud, <laughs> it was it's fraud, fraud. Yeah, so was, you know, and they they did whatever they needed to do to make it look like it wasn't. And uh, we were always about integrity and shit mm-hmm. like that. And so to have our name in question was yeah. like beyond. And then it kind of brings me back to like when I said Nick mailed out demo 96, and it's like. Well, that came into play, but then these guys pulled some bullshit out saying that they were around in 95. I mean, it was a flat-out lie, but... Those guys know, weren't even they knew their, old their enough attor- to be in a band. Their attorney yeah. knew yeah. that we weren't going to litigate yeah. because we was going to litigate this. Yeah. And so, you know, we came to an agreement. Sorry for the... Uh, we came to an agreement um, that we would do irate and why. Um, and, but, but the whole thing is funny because... You know, I say, I mentioned lawyer, I mentioned um, department of, uh, well, you know, copyright office or whatever. Meanwhile, IRATE's acronym is Infinite Rebellion Against the Establishment. <laughs> but not even using, IRATE. They're using, you know, law and government entities to hold us down when the truth is we never <laughs> even fucking filed for a copyright and all that. Yeah. You know, trademark. Uh, trademark, yeah. um, which is dumb, but we did have those sealed... Um, you know, tapes. Um, but that's because we were we we're not like that. We we're, we wanted to just play our music and be real. And right. um, I think that's kind of what was the appeal for us. Um, which they never had. They, yeah, which they, they never had. This, they tried to create that. You know, and they, they got dissed. <laughs> against the establishment, but wanted sponsorships from guitar companies and all this. So they were so full of yeah. shit. They were riding the uh, establishment stick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were. But that they took were. a toll. Point is, yeah. that took, took a toll. A toll. Took a toll. Um, it was something that, um, you know, we worked hard. And then, you know, we, we even changed the name of Irate for a while. Yeah, some, we played shows with... Other names. Yeah, we had some other names because we were we were so pissed, but we were like, "Fuck this!" We're trying we're to figure it out. Yeah, sure. I rate New York, but you know, you can't you can't be a band with aspirations of, you know, uh, uh, you know, not world takeover, but you know, being bigger than your local area, and then but have, um, area, you know, yeah. like a, a, a geographical connotation to your name because yeah, you limit right. yourself. Um, I mean, there's nobody out there who's like such and such Chicago. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I guess yeah, the band Chicago. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and towards the end, we had um, people helping us out. So Doc from Doc for, uh, God Forbid uh-huh. uh, was on our team. And so was Lorenzo and Tanucci from Sworn Enemy. I they were both it, working together to help us with a name change and help rebrand. Yeah. But, but that been, was harder we, we, than, But we've been in this game yeah, so, long, so long at that, at that point. point yeah. It wasn't like something that a new band would want would do. It wasn't. Yeah. We weren't up for that. Yeah. You know, we're old dogs. Yeah. If you will. Yeah, I mean, sure. we're not that. We weren't that old. But we've been around. For but like we've been decade, around enough right? where we're like, fuck decade, this, yeah. you know. Yeah. Decade strong. Yeah, decade you know, strong. and yeah. but that's it's kind so, of the, un, the unappealing factor of us, right? From a per business perspective, a record label, whatever. Yeah. You know, why would they want to? sign old dogs when they can get somebody who's hungry and you know and they could mold yeah you know. because we weren't that and that's yeah. fine you know we realized that so that's that's kind of like what contributed to um, the demise of the band um that makes sense yeah um yeah. 
So, so will there ever, at, at this point, I know, I know um, you, you said you have been militant about this in the past, but will there ever be a reunion show or anything like that? You all think? Um, I highly doubt it. Yeah. Um, just because, um, you know, we don't have any plans for it, yeah, but sure. I'll, I'm not the type to say never. Um, that's for sure, you know, because life is interesting and things happen, but, um, no, there's no promises here. That's for sure. There are no current plans. <laughs> yeah. No current plans. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm open. Yeah. And so am I. Yeah. Um, but if it doesn't, that's fine too. Yeah, sure. You know, sure. Uh, him and I still create in other a avenues and we're having fun with that. And, uh. You know, if, even if we didn't play ever again, I'd be fine with that. Yeah. I really would. I mean, you've definitely you know. left things that will stand the test of time. Yes. yes. Um, and people still love it. And they keep us alive in that regard. Yep. Um, so I think that's beautiful. And I don't think... I guess we were one of those bands that said, you know, it's over. And that was it. Yep. Yeah. You know? But again, never say never. Right? But <laughs> Plus, no plans. You know, um, when bands come back and reunite and they don't have new material, I feel like they are become like a cover band of their own stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's true, it's true. And I'm I'm not I'm not trying to be an irate cover band. Yeah. We're gonna either be irate or not. And you know, if if you come up if you do something like the reunion, I think you gotta give people something new. Yeah. And uh, you know, that's just my belief. Um it's easy to just say, "Oh, we're back," and then we're sure. not. And, sure. And, and and all props to everyone who does that. I I'm not hating on anybody. I mean, there's there's people who have fun and make money and get all the satisfaction they're looking for from doing that. I um, but I, I've always been like, you know, the band died. Yeah, that's it. Now that said, for the and this is my burden. For the last 18 years, I am bombarded with offers all the time. I see. Two days ago, Eberfest called. And they were <laughs> like, come, please. B&B <laughs> Bowl. This is hardcore. <laughs> of course. I'm Every sure. year I'm hearing for I'm the sure. two Joes. Now, now they can get the official story. <laughs> yeah. I'm the fucking asshole. <laughs> but guess yeah. what? Guess what? So guess what? Um, where was I going with this? Because I don't, I don't remember now. I don't know. You, uh, about... you were saying like Black and Blue Bowl. Yeah, and all they all, offers. and they're, I love all of them. They think of us every year. They don't have to. Yeah. There are so many bands that they can get to reunite, and they have. They have had some great reunions at these shows. But, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a, I don't want to be mean and say burden, but it's hard. To say no yeah, sure. to people you know and respect. Sure. You understand? Because the, the two Joes, the b, b Joe and this is Hardcore Joe, I love those guys. They're great friends. I've been on a, a, a Joe Hardcore's podcast. Like, I, really great people. Yeah. You know, I get calls from Tsunami Fest every year and then all the European and Japanese. Yep. So that's kind of the burden I have on my shoulder to say no all the time, and it sucks. Burden of a fill, of a fill, of a, yes, bibs. <laughs> fill bibs, of a crumbling fill uh, bibs. <laughs> you know, and it's a tough pill. It's yeah. a tough pill because I, I'd like to say yes one day, sure, but it is what it is. Um, so the final question I have for all of you, and it could just be a straight up no answer: um, Is there a Bronx metal sound? And if there is, what does it sound or feel like? Currently? I'd, I'd say... In general. You could take it, yeah, in general. general. Yeah, you could take it any direction. Uh, I'm going to say it sounds like Irene. Okay. And, and because the other bands that came out of here were more, mostly more hardcore based. Yeah. You know, yes, they have their, their metal parts, their sure. melodic parts and everything. But we were that from jump. Yep. You know. Uh, did we mix things in in the in the in the pot? Sure, you know everything from our urban influences of hip hop to to metal to death metal to hardcore it was all in there. Yeah. But at the core, we were metal as fuck. Yeah. You know, we just got accepted by the hardcore scene who welcomed us with open arms. Yeah. 
But anybody that you ask, they're going to be like, yeah, I race a metal band. Yeah. At least here, our friends sure. understand that. Our fans, maybe they see us as a hardcore band because we had so many, you know, danceable parts and slams and all that stuff. And that's a hardcore thing, sure. right? So, but I'm gonna I'm gonna say I rate. That's a good answer. No, no, go you, you agree? I yeah yeah totally. I mean, we had all these different influences, like Phil said, and we shaped this particular type of sound. Um, you know, while there were other bands that came out of the you know the Bronx, um, you know, everybody has their own you know influences, but mm -hmm. you know we. With the collection of the, you know, all the stuff that we all listen to separately, you know, came together really nicely and, and you know, made this nice real hard edge uh, metal sound. It's urban metal from the Bronx. Yeah, urban metal. Urban metal, yeah. The guys from Hellbound, uh, they use, they had similar comments, but they use the term, I think, ghetto metal. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Anyway. Um, UV, what what do you what do you think? Um, I'm gonna go totally opposite than these. <laughs> nah, nah. <laughs> it's always fun when people do that. You know, do whatever, whatever you um, think the answer is. I think we've always strived to have our own flavor. You know, we're not reinventing anything. Um, we're just regurgitating. You know, each and every one's likes that we've accumulated. You know, from from you know young age, absorbing all the the music that we like, but not only just music, the culture, right? The, we're all different people, right? These guys are Puerto Rican. I'm Jewish. Nick's uh, Irish descent, and um, so we all had different life experiences, and um, you know, so it's not just what we sound like; it's also you know the lyrical content sure. the um the vibe and so because we were born in the bronx because we are mostly from the bronx like three-fifths of the band or yeah. like us three and, um we can be labeled that we can claim that right because you can't claim something if it ain't fucking real that's right. and that shit is real we were born here we're all um proud of it and um i guess it's that's that's what it is i mean to me i'd have to have somebody else really uh, uh confirm that yeah. i mean sure. because i mean i don't say I that i'm did. this or that <laughs> <laughs> somebody out of the band <laughs> preferably but but yeah we are the bronx we, we are, are very bronx. much part of the bronx and we're proud of it we're very very much proud well, thank you. Do any of you all want to um, share any final thoughts or shout outs or anything like that? I want to say that if you would have asked me 30 years ago, would I rate be enshrined into the Bronx Historical Society? I'd be like, you're fucking crazy. <laughs> uh, but here we are. Yeah. And it's beautiful. My mom is so proud of us. You know, I've had this discussion with her in the last week. And our families are proud of us, and I'm proud of us, we're proud of us. We made music that will last generations, and it is the highest honor to be here today talking about the history of the band and to have it forever live on in this borough. So thank you for that. Thank you for your recognition of heavy music in the Bronx. Thank you for talking to all the other bands that we had the pleasure of playing with and being friends with. Uh, it's been cool seeing those interviews. Um, and we're still here, man. We're still here. We're still loving the heavy music and, and in some cases still doing it. And so uh, just love to everyone, love to you, love to this organization, and love to the motherfucking Bronx. Awesome. Oh, wow. Any uh, final what? thoughts for you, Nando? Um, not much, but thank you for uh, conducting this interview with us. Um, it was uh, really nice to have a walk down memory lane and, and, and just tell our story of how we started. Um, I'm definitely, you know, proud of all the things that you know we were able to achieve, and um, uh, 
Thank you very much. Also, want to give a shout out to my girlfriend, Roxanne. I know she's going to be watching this on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> to my wife, Nikki. Love you. And Jason and Joey. Love you, my boys. And mom. That's not fair. That's what I was going to do. I was just going <laughs> to say oh, shout Shit, out. I almost forgot my family. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Uh, yeah, shout out to my wonderful wife, Nina, my two kids, Liam and Nika. Love you guys. They were uh, spent part of their lives in the Bronx before our move to Westchester. So a little bit of Bronx in their blood as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, everything these guys said, it's so cool to be a part of this, to be a part of a borough that, you know, we've all called home and Nando still does. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful place. We love it here. Thanks. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.